Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This is S4A live stream number 75, being recorded on December 29, 2022. And we are doing our year-end COVID-19 roundup. This is part two. We started part one yesterday uh, in live stream number 74. I'm hoping we can wrap it up today and not have to do too many more sessions to end this. But basically, as I was explaining yesterday, I had an entire window in my browser devoted to COVID articles, and I just wasn't able to really parse through them over the last few months. So like since August, I've been kind of collecting various articles and things, and we've done a few of them here and there, but we're trying to do them all in a big lump for the end of the year. There's actually still like a good two dozen that I thought I was going to be able to get to today before the stream, and I wasn't. But we have plenty left over from yesterday. In fact, I'm not even sure we're going to be able to get through all of the leftovers from yesterday today. So we're going to do what we can. And um, yeah, I'm hoping that maybe we can just do this in two parts, although there may be a third. We will see. So without further ado, I'd like to get into it, but just a little bit more ado. Uh, let's thank the patrons, patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for $2 a month or more. Every little helps. Uh, it's encouraging. It's also materially helpful. I would make content even if nobody supported, but um, I wouldn't be able to spend so much time on it. So the support really allows me to make this a focus and it sustains me as far as being able to plan how much content I'm going to be able to do month to month, um, keeping the streaming going, keeping the audiobooks going, as well as all the background research that goes into this. People may not be aware, but you know, planning what I'm going to do in the <clears throat> in a span of a few weeks on the channel. Um, that takes a fair amount of reading and setting it up and doing the backstory and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that is appreciated. <clears throat> oh, forgot to clear my throat extensively before starting. Um, it really helps to, you know, just devote the proper time to this channel and keep the content going consistently. So thank you. To the patrons, if you like this channel, thank a patron and consider becoming one. Also, engagement counts, so like, share, subscribe, and comment, even if you are not a patron. And uh, yeah, you can also follow over at twitch.tv slash socialismS4A. That's where we're streaming this live right now, and then it'll be posted on the YouTube channel after at socialism for all F-O-R-A-L-L. -L. And we're on Twitter at socialism s 4 a as well. So just to start this off, we did this in yesterday's intro, but real quick, here's a snapshot of where we're at in the pandemic. Obviously, it's pretty much unchecked. Um, and I think that, you know, when they say we're out of the pandemic phase, we're obviously not. And um, the difference between 2022 versus 2021 is there were many um, transmission controls in place. Some of them were half-assed, but you know we didn't really do like actual lockdowns ever really in the US or similar countries um, because even in April and you know March 2020, you could still do emergency things, which included things like grocery stores and other convenience stores and things like that. So people were definitely getting out and mixing, albeit less, and there were mask mandates in place and you know, there was social distancing and things like that at that time. And you can see that the curve overall was much lower outside of the winter when, of course, everybody went indoors and was spreading it in stale, um, you know, non-fresh air inside. And also people are just, your immune system is weaker in the winter. Um, you're under more stress from the cold and not everywhere is super cold in the U.S., but many places are. That puts a strain. Also, your vitamin D is lower. You get that from sunshine. You can also get your skin synthesizes it when sunlight hits it. Um, and, you know, in the back half of the year, a lot of latitudes in the U.S. just simply cannot get enough vitamin D from the sun. For one thing, in the winter, it's colder, so you're wearing more clothing, so there's less um, sunlight exposed. And then also the earth is tilting away. That's why we have winter in the first place. Uh, from the sun, so the sun isn't as strong. Also, if you have darker skin, um, you need more sunlight exposure to um, get the same amount of vitamin D. And also, if you are on the heavier side, vitamin D is fat-soluble, 
And um, if you are overweight or obese, that can impact how much vitamin D you need because um, it can kind of get squirreled away elsewhere in your body. So, you know, we're going to actually, at the end of this, whether it's today or tomorrow, look at a few over-the-counter health things. Like, obviously, the main thing is in N95, we trust. Look at how much COVID is going around. Um, I'm going to come back to the whole pandemic thing in a second. Uh, N95s are the main thing. Just stop the virus from getting in your body. Vaccine as a backup in case you do get infected. And then also, you know, while you're trying to convalesce and overcome the infection, we're going to look at a few possible over-the-counter, non-toxic, cheap things to do, like the vitamin D, maybe vitamin C, melatonin, things like that. And again, these are extreme backups, but you want to do N95 vaccine, get the Paxlovid if you can, although it has limited benefit for people um, under a certain age. So yeah, once you get it, you're kind of you know, just SOL. And so we're really trying to avoid getting it in the first place. But we'll look at a few things. Anyway, as far as the, you know, we're out of the pandemic phase, they were doing more transmission controls in 2020 and 2021, and they kept the curve down. Now this year, they decided to say, well, what if we just don't control spread at all? We don't have mask mandates, none of that. Will it just spike uncontrollably? And it's not spiking uncontrollably, but it is spreading uncontrollably. And so, you know, we're getting just a certain amount of peak right now with the current strains that we have, but people are getting reinfected every few months. And that's not good at all, as we're going to cover. Every subsequent reinfection ups your risk of all the different kinds of organ damage and clotting and heart attacks and everything else, strokes and uh, you name it as far as, actually here, let's throw up the, the long COVID, um, long COVID symptoms there. Here we go. Yeah, there's a breakdown for you. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to keep talking over that. You can pause if you really just want to study the chart for a minute. But anyway, uh, yeah, they're just like, okay, well, we stopped all the transmission controls and we're having this gigantic plateau throughout the entire year, which is roughly equivalent to like, if you took the March and February 2020 um, surges and the winter 2020, 2021, and the Delta wave, and you just sort of lumped them all together, we just have that ongoing at this point, as you could see from the wastewater. And so people are racking up all of the various problems that you're seeing here, even if they're not dying. And as far as the um, you know governments and health departments are concerned, that's sufficient. And even China is jumping on this bandwagon now. We're going to do a section on China uh, later on, but they're unfortunately following the same um, ridiculous logic that the U.S. is doing. Here's a tweet from that. Uh, Hua Chunying, Chinese government official, with Omicron less likely to cause hospitalization and death. That's a fancy way of saying it's, quote, mild, which is a lie. The focus of China's COVID response has shifted from infection prevention to health protection and fatality pre prevention based on a scientific, they should have put that one in quotes as well, assessment of the COVID situation, which is predictable, no it isn't, and being brought under control. Predictable is another way of, again, fancy way of saying endemic. Uh, it's not under control, it's mutating like crazy. There's a horrific situation in China. So this is a fucking lie. This is a lie, what you're looking at on the screen right here. This is a complete lie. So now China is adopting the Omicron is mild. It's controllable. We're out of the pandemic phase and all of the other lies that you've been hearing from the US and the EU for a year now, you're hearing them from China as well. But um, yeah, so you know, this is the situation. Does it look over to you? It does not look over to me. But let's just jump straight into this. I will come up for air periodically and, um, you know, break between articles and sections to talk with the chat. We got about two dozen people in the chat right now. I just want to reiterate the three major points. One, there is no end in sight to the COVID-19 pandemic. Two, COVID-19's effects are far worse than the average person understands. And three, the USA and most other countries are moving in exactly the wrong direction in their response to it. And we will show you uh, what we mean by that in the stream today. And I was just about to go 
to a couple articles that I had specially set out for the intro here and I'm like did I just go all right I'll tell you what so we were gonna do a Southwest Airlines uh, thing Southwest is having massive cancellations which they're saying uh, might have something to do with COVID they're saying labor shortage let's just look at that quickly and then we'll get into the general COVID stuff so this is from yesterday Southwest Airlines flight cancellations continue to snowball it's from the Chicago Tribune by David Koenig and um, move on to the next screen there so Dallas uh, and this is going on all over the country I saw footage from Phoenix and anyway travelers who counted on Southwest Airlines to get them home obviously people have been traveling for the holidays, suffered another wave of canceled flights Wednesday, and pressure grew on the federal government to help customers get reimbursed for unexpected expenses they incurred because of the airline's meltdown. Exhausted Southwest travelers tried finding seats on other airlines or renting cars to get to their destination, but many remained stranded. The airline's CEO said it could be next week before the flight schedule returns to normal. Adontis Barber, a 34-year-old a jazz pianist from Kansas City, Missouri, had camped out in the city's airport since his Southwest flight was canceled Saturday and wondered if he would ever get to a New Year's gig in Washington, D.C. Quote, I give up, he said. I'm starting to feel homeless. By early afternoon on the East Coast, about 90% of all canceled flights Wednesday in the U.S. were on Southwest according to the Flight Aware tracking service. Other airlines recovered from ferocious winter storms that hit large swaths of the country over the weekend, but not Southwest, which scrubbed 2,500 flights on Wednesday and 2,300 more on Thursday. That's a lot of flights, and then multiply that by however many hundred passengers per plane. By mid-afternoon at Chicago's Midway Airport, where Southwest is the dominant carrier, the airline had canceled 231 flights scheduled for Wednesday, counting for every cancellation that day out of the airport, according to Flight Aware. Southwest canceled another 37 flights at O'Hare International Airport. The Dallas airline was undone by a combination of factors, including an antiquated crew scheduling system and a network design that allows cancellations in one region to cascade throughout the country rapidly. Those weaknesses are not new. They helped cause a similar failure by Southwest in October 2021. So they had 14 months to fix those problems to the extent that it is their system and not COVID, which is, of course, ripping right now. Um, but again, you don't see it affecting all the things. So this is probably something like that, plus their system problems. The federal government is now investigating uh, because Southwest carries more passengers within the U.S. than any other airline. The CEO said that... Um, They'd be on a reduced schedule, but hope to be back on track before next week. And uh, they blame the winter storm for snarling the airline's highly complex network. Is this your first winter? Like, what's going on exactly? We're working on making this right, he said, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. People can't reach them on the phone. Um, and uh, we have some video from one of the airports, actually, um, as we finish this article here. So... Um, she said that, so Teal Williams, stuck at the Denver airport, said that Southwest employees had no information about flights and didn't offer food vouchers. Well, so it's just like, oh, you're stuck at the airport, that's your problem. Well, you know, maybe people weren't planning on getting stuck there for four days. While elderly passengers sit, sat in wheelchairs for hours and mothers ran out of formula for their infants. It was just imploding and no one could tell you anything, Williams said. The airline employees were desperately trying to help, but you could tell they were just as clueless as everybody else. It was scary. So they're in the dark. The employees don't know what to do. Uh, people are missing out on all kinds of things. And then you have this shit going on. So here is a cop. I believe it's a cop. It could be a... Um, security guard but uh so this is in nashville nashville airport cop threatens to arrest stranded passengers standing in line at a southwest counter to rebook their flight very very helpful thank you for your service here we go whoop let's hey let's retry that with some volume how does that sound two and her needs to leave or you'll be arrested for trespass are you kidding me go are you filming that? Yeah. Okay. Right now, everybody to the unsecured side. 
ticket counter will help you with any questions you have. Go. Is it this is Yes. You have no ticket. You don't need to be in the secured side. Let's go. Let's keep we have tickets. Your ticket just got canceled. This is, we're not here for that flight. We're on a layover. Like, there ain't no, like... We we're not okay. Southwest gate. <laughs> we're not even here for yeah, this flight. What are you trying to do? Tampa. 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 Uh, so, are you guys all? Everybody here is trying to go to Tampa. I don't know. No. no. I mean, we're we didn't ask everybody. I got nowhere to go. Yeah, yeah that's my wife. I got nowhere to go. Like, <laughs> we're stuck here. What can I do for you? Okay, so are we just going to be kicked to the curb, or are you going to this? You can't kick us out of the airport. Like, I, you, know. um, you said you're going to arrest people for trespassing, yes. for being at a ticket counter for a If you flight. don't have a valid ticket, then you're on the secured side to refuse to leave, you will be arrested. We do have tickets. We have okay. valid tickets. They're just not to Washington, D.C. or Phoenix. All right. Well, if your ticket is canceled, you no longer have a ticket. You understand that, right? No, because they rescheduled. No, they don't. They tell you we are told at the counters that we have to see a CSA. We are told well, right now, Southwest is calling us because you guys are congregated right here, and they're trying to close that gate. No, sir, we're not and we're telling we're you to get information. Okay, well, we're telling you your information is at the ticket counter. Please go to the ticket counter. So you're saying the outside, outside of the security. Okay, that ticket counter. Okay, thank you. Okay. So that's fun. Um, anyway, United States, this is what we get here. So this is just, you know, a little slice of life from the current situation in the U.S. And yeah, that's partly caused by whatever's going on with Southwest's, um, you know, computer system. But it's also because of, you know, labor shortage. So, you know, this is now the euphemism for like practically everything as things break down. Uh, we go into massive recession and things stop working. All right, so let's um, take a look here at a couple of, I guess, tone setting articles for understanding the entire situation that we're in. This is a little abstract from an article in um, uh, medical healthcare philosophy or medicine and healthcare philosophy um, on the relationship between individual and population health. The relationship between individual and population health is partially built on the broad dichotomization of medicine into clinical medicine and public health. Potential drawbacks of current views include seeing both individual and population health as absolute and independent concepts. I will argue that the relationship between individual and population health is largely relative and dynamic. Their interrelated dynamism derives from a causally defined life course perspective on health determination, starting from an individual's conception through growth, development, and participation in the collective until death, all seen within the context of an adaptive society. Indeed, it will become clear that neither individual nor population health is identifiable or even definable without informative contextualization within the other. For instance, a person's health cannot be seen in isolation, but must be placed in the rich contextual web, such as the socioeconomic circumstances and other health determinants of where they were conceived, born, bred, and how they shaped and were shaped by their environment and communities, especially given the prevailing population health exposures over their lifetime. We cannot discuss the what and how much of individual and population health until we know the cumulative trajectories of both using appropriate causal language. So what we have in this pandemic is a situation where the government, all the way up to Joe Biden, is constantly harping on taking care of yourself and individual measures to get through the pandemic, where clearly there are many societal, structural, population or public health factors that are just being thrown out the window. I would say that they're being ignored, but they've been acknowledged. They've even been utilized. We had pretty significant uh, population health measures in place in 2020 and 2021, and they have been consciously discarded at this point. And everything's being put on the individual. But that line, you know, it's um, 
they're using ineffective tools is one way I guess that you could put it. So we have individual tools, things like hand washing and mask wearing, and okay, that's great. But we also need to make sure that this is going on within a context where these things can be maximally effective. And that concerns decisions being made with you know, structural um, decisions that are not the province of the individual. And this is just something that our highly individualistic society you know, which is that way because of capitalism, private property, for-profit industry, all that kind of stuff. That is that is the root of this and why we are unable to have a proper uh, pandemic response and why they're basically giving up on it now. So um, speaking of this very topic, let's continue with the next article. Uh, the Pandemic's Soft Closing by Catherine Wu. Now I've covered a few pandemic stories by Catherine Wu. Um, the Atlantic, and I think that they often need, you know, extra notes or correction, but, uh, you know, clearly not written by a Marxist, but um, there's ample ground for us to at least walk along this track, even if we need to add a few things. So the CDC's latest COVID guidelines are the closest that the nation's leaders have come to saying that the coronavirus crisis is done. So, of course, they can't come right out and say that because that would be absurd. But they can tell you other lies, like it's mild, or it's under control, or it's, quote, endemic, which, as we've covered in previous um, COVID videos, endemic means that something is native to a particular region, that the general rate of spread is um, neither rising nor falling, etc. COVID-19 is not doing that. It's spreading like crazy. It is mutating rapidly. It's becoming... Uh, replaced by new strains every two to three months, each of which is more immune escaping and more contagious than the last. So it's anything but under control. So they can't come out and say that. That would be absurd. But they will uh, act as though it is while doing a soft closing. So let's read. A quick skim of the CDC's latest COVID guidelines might give the impression, and this is from a few months ago, that this fall could feel a lot like the ones that we had in the before times, before COVID. Millions of Americans will be working in person at offices and schools and universities will be back in full swing. There will be few or no mask, uh, t masking, testing or vaccination mandates in place. Sniffles or viral exposures won't be reason enough to keep employees or students at home and requirements for six feet social distancing will most mostly be relegated to the tinder profiles of those seeking trysts with the tall oh real knee slapper there americans have been given the all clear to dispense with most of the pandemic centric behaviors that have defined the past two plus years part and parcel of the narrative that the biden administration is building around the quote triumphant return to normalcy by the way, the normalcy hugging and that whole you know, cult of normalcy, this is just another face of denial. Um, people gravitate toward that extreme need for, quote, normalcy. It's a part of denying a current crisis, and that just gets you nowhere. Says Joshua Salomon, a health policy researcher at Stanford, where mitigation measures once moved in near lockstep with case numbers, hospitalizations, and deaths, they're now on separate tracks. The focus with COVID is more explicitly than ever before on avoiding only severe illness and death. And again, severe, acute, short-term illness and death that is clearly the result of the immediate infection and pretty much just ignoring long COVID, even if it results in death within the next 12 months. The country seems close to declaring the national public health emergency done. And short of that proclamation, officials are already quote, effectively acting as though it's over, says Lakshmi Ganapathy, a pediatric infectious disease specialist at Boston Children's Hospital. If there's such a thing as a soft closing of the COVID crisis, this latest juncture might be it. And as I've been saying this whole time, they've been moving in this direction really since mask or vax in May 2021. Um, the question is, when does it get bad enough that they can, that the denial doesn't get sold anymore. You know, the, the people are no longer buying it. 
The shift in guidelines underscores how settled the country is into the current state of affairs. This new relaxation of COVID rules is one of the most substantial to date, but it wasn't spurred by a change in conditions on the ground. Exactly. It's just political interest. A slew of Omicron subvariants are still burning across most states. COVID deaths have, for months, remained at a stubborn, too-high plateau. The virus won't budge, nor will Americans, so the administration is shifting its stance instead. No longer will people be required to quarantine after encountering the infected, even if they haven't gotten the recommended number of shots. By the way, about the mandates, um, we sometimes, uh, there's another channel, Revolutionary Blackout Network, used to be known as the Fred Hampton leftists until Fred Hampton Jr. told them to stop, um, RBN for short. They just put a thing out, their video literally last night had in the headline, um, COVID-19 being used to create a police state. What are you even talking about? Official U.S. policy is COVID is over. What the fuck are you talking about? These like mandate people, the the anti-vax people, they just won't stop. You won, okay? You won for now. All of this stuff, the mandates are fucking gone. What are you even talking about? They're talking point. I guess they just keep getting the checks to just keep saying this shit regardless, just in case it were to come back. But it is completely not evidence-based. What police state are you talking about in relation to COVID-19? Everything is reopened. There are no mandates. What the fuck are you talking about? Anyway, continuing. Schools and workplaces will no longer need to screen healthy students and employees, and guidance around physical distancing is now a footnote at best. All this is happening as the Northern Hemisphere barrels towards fall, a time when students cluster in classrooms, families mingle indoors, and respiratory viruses go hog wild. The monkeypox outbreak balloons. Now that is since capped, but we had 30,000 cases whereas previous outbreaks were like 200, and there was only like one of them. And the healthcare system remains strained. The main COVID guardrail left is a request for people to stay up to date on their vaccines, which most in the U.S. are not. Most kids under five who have opted for the Pfizer vaccine won't even have had enough time to finish their three-dose primary series by the time the school year starts. In an email, Jasmine Reed, a public affairs specialist for the CDC, suggested the Pfizer timing mismatch wasn't a concern because, quote, a very high proportion of children have some level of protection from previous infection or vaccination, even though infection alone isn't as powerfully protective as vaccination. Quote, it's like they're throwing their hands up in the air, says Rupali LeMay, a public health researcher and behavioral scientist at Johns Hopkins University. People aren't going to follow the guidance, so let's just loosen up the guidance. And that's the approach they've been taking, and it just, that's not going to get you good results. For many, many months now, U.S. policy on the virus has emphasized the importance of individual responsibility for keeping the virus at bay. These latest updates simply reinforce that posture. And again, this is from a couple months ago, so we're living in that world now. But given their timing and scope, this, more than any other pandemic inflection point, feels like a, quote, wholesale abandonment of a community-centric mindset, says Ariana Marie Planey, a medical geographer at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, one that firmly codifies the choose-your-own-adventure approach. Although... Uh, yes, it's choose your own adventure, but it's also you're choosing other people's adventure because if you go out sick without a mask, you are infecting other people. Read, meanwhile, and by the way, every last uh, Democrat that in 2021 and 2020 was saying, yeah, those bad Republicans, um, you know, you don't want to wear a mask and this and that. Literally, the minute your guy got into office, you just followed whatever he said, whether it was evidence-based or not. Science party, you know, party of science, my ass. Uh, the Democrats are as much of a problem every time they get into power, every single fucking time. And, you know, people just cling to them because, oh, but the Republicans. Well, until the left steps away from the Democratic Party, we just don't have any hope. We're going to be going around in the cycle forever. Anyway. Uh, Reed, meanwhile, described the updates as an attempt to streamline national recommendations so that people could, quote, better understand their personal risk, adding that the CDC would emphasize the minimum actions people need to take to protect communities with options to add on. 
just think about what we're talking about. Yeah, optionally, you can not die. Optionally, you can get deep vein thrombosis. Optionally, you can get a stroke. Optionally, you can have crippling fatigue. Um, why are these even being considered? Then again, we have a homelessness epidemic in the country. That's considered a valid option. As far as people, though, understanding their personal risk, no one does. Because we went through a bunch of long COVID stuff yesterday. We're going to cover more long COVID stuff today. And believe you me, people do not understand the actual risks of COVID. Ashish Jha, the White House's top COVID advisor, did not respond to multiple requests for comment on this. It is true that as the CDC epidemiologist Greta Massetti said in a press briefing last week, quote, the current conditions of this pandemic are very different. Not really. Uh, the country has cooked up tests, treatments, and vaccines. I mean, yes and no. Paxlovid works if you're over 65. It may have some benefit under that, but, you know, there have been studies on that. Uh, there are vaccines now, but people are getting repeatedly infected within the same month, which is upping their odds of all kinds of organ damage and potentially fatal complications. And the rapid tests don't work for shit. Um, you need really PCR tests to really know. The rapid test is, uh, you know, an educated guess, basically. So, no, it's not really very different. By some estimates, roughly three quarters of the country harbors at least some immunity to recent variants. Again, um, you know, that quote, natural immunity is temporary, limited, you can still get reinfected, and it comes at a gigantic cost of systemic uh, inflammation and the risk of long COVID, you know, including brain damage. So that's your natural immunity. It's temporary, you know, fleeting, limited, and it hurts you to get that. It, there's a big cost. You can't just run wild. And this is for now. What happens when the virus has another quantum leap in evolution, like Omicron was a quantum leap away from Delta? What happens when it has another big evolutionary jump, and then we're suddenly dealing with something with a 5% mortality rate? What will people be willing to do then who are in power? What will they have to be forced to do? Are people even considering, contemplating what it will take as far as demonstrations, demands, shutdowns, etc., to get actual protections. As far as I can see, they absolutely are not. You know, I started this channel three years ago, basically at the beginning of the pandemic, and uh, I was more optimistic at that point, um, for sure. Anyway, but those tools and others remain disproportionately available to the socioeconomically privileged. Meanwhile, Planey told me people who are poor, chronically ill, disabled, immunocompromised, uninsured, raci racially and ethnically marginalized, or working high-risk jobs are still struggling to access resources, a disparity exacerbated by the ongoing lack of emergency COVID funds. Know your risk, protect yourself, the infographics read, even though that me before we concept is fundamentally incompatible with tempering an infectious disease, let alone an airborne infectious disease. If wide gaps in health remain between the fortunate and the less fortunate, the virus will inevitably exploit them. The most recent pivots are not likely to spark a wave of behavioral change. Most people already weren't quarantining after exposures or routinely being tested by their schools or workplaces or keeping six feet apart. But shifting guidance could still pretend trouble long term. One of the CDC's main impetuses for change appears to have been nudging its guidance closer to what the public has felt the status quo should be, a seemingly backward position to adopt. Yeah, because the public doesn't know the evidence, the public doesn't know the science, and therefore they're just doing what is feels convenient to them. It's not evidence-based. Policies are what normalize behaviors, says Daniel Goldberg, a public health ethicist at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. If that process begins to operate in reverse, quote, if you always just permit what people are doing to set your policies, guaranteed you're going to preserve the status quo. Now, as recommendations repeatedly describe rather than influence behavior, the country is locked into a circular feedback loop we can't seem to get out of, Ganapathy told me. The policies weaken. People lose interest in following them, spurring officials to slacken them even more. 
That trend in and of itself is perhaps another form of surrender to individualism in following the choices of single citizens rather than leading the way to a reality that's better for us all. No matter how people are acting at this crossroads, this closing won't work in the way that the thoroughly neoliberal administration might hope. We can't right now entirely shut the door on the pandemic. Certainly not if the overarching goal is to help Americans, quote, move to a point where COVID-19 no longer severely disrupts our daily lives, as Massetti noted in a press release. And note the uh, skillful deployment of the word severely. Oh, it can disrupt your life, but just not severely as, you know, the Biden administration chooses to define that. Maybe that would be an option, quote, if we were genuinely at a point in this pandemic where cases didn't matter, said Jason Salemi, an epidemiologist at the University of South Florida. Relaxed guidance would genuinely be less disruptive if more people, both in this country and others, were up to date on their vaccines. Uh, there are countries that are much more vaccinated than the U.S. and they're still having this problem. Masks before vaccines obviously do both, but... Masks are key. The vaccine is still going to let you mostly spread and transmit the virus. The mask has much more of an effect on transmission than the vaccine does. Or if SARS coronavirus 2 was far less capable of sparking severe disease and long COVID didn't exist. Reed of the CDC told me that the agency's, quote, emphasis on preventing severe disease will also help prevent cases of post-COVID conditions. You'll lower the odds, but even if you're fully vaccinated, your odds are one in six of getting long COVID. And it depends on the specific demographic you're in. That's really high odds. That's really high odds. So you got 100,000 people that get COVID. You're looking at like 17,000, 20,000 that get long COVID, even if you're fully vaccinated. So, yeah. Adding that, quote, vaccines are an important tool, I don't disagree, in preventing and treating post-COVID conditions but immunization can't completely block long COVID. Again, the best it seems to do is reduce your odds to one in six of getting long COVID. And it seems to relieve its symptoms only in a subset of people. Guaranteed paid sick leave, universal health care, and equitable resource allocation would also reduce the toll of loosening the nation's disaster playbook. So we could go back to the paying people to stay home, hazard pay, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, how many, um, you know, various like state governments and things, city governments had pressures to increase the minimum wage and do hazard pay? And how many of them are able to squeak out of that now because of what Biden's White House is facilitating here? This whole, oh, COVID is basically over. Yeah, no need to raise the minimum wage or anything like that. So we can't even get these like basic reforms that we need. Layered onto this reality, however, chiller guidelines will only spur further transmission, Planey told me. Upending school and workplace schedules, delaying care in medical center settings, and seeding more long-term disability. For much of the pandemic, a contingent of people has been working to advance the narrative that the measures to prevent transmission are the cause of disruption, Stanford Salomon told me. So in other words, it's like the shutdowns uh, and all the other things people are doing to not spread the virus. That's, you know, that's that, those are the real disruption. Vanishing those mitigations then would purport to rid the country of the burdens the past couple of years have brought. You know, so in other words, if the government tells you, you know, we need to uh, not work or something, then that's the only real disruption. Otherwise, everybody's just supposed to tough it out. And if you get disruptions from that, well, we'll just find somebody else to scapegoat. But it can't be the virus. It can't be that this system, capitalism, is just incompatible, first of all, uh, with just basic stability. It breaks down every few years due to the boom and bust cycle. But beyond that, that it can't really um, weather natural disasters like uh, a pandemic very well at all. And they want to divert that attention and criticism off of the system onto anything else. But unfettered viral spread can wreak widespread havoc as well. Right now, the country has been walking down an interminable plateau of coronavirus cases and deaths. The latter and stubbornly hovering just under 500, a number that the country has, by virtue of its behaviors or lack thereof, implicitly decided is just fine. 
quote, it's much lower than we've been, but it's not a trivial number. Salemi told me, held at this rate, the U.S.'s annual COVID death toll could be about 150,000, three times the mortality burden of the worst influenza season of the past decade. And the country has little guarantee that the current mortality average will even hold. Immunity provides a buffer against severe disease, but that protection may be impermanent, especially as the virus continues to shapeshift, abetted by unchecked international spread. Should the autumn bring with it yet another spike in cases, I mean, we're having that now, long COVID, hospitalizations, and deaths, the country will need to be flexible and responsive enough to pivot back to more strictness, which the administration is setting Americans up poorly to do. Acceptance of the present might presage acceptance of a future that's worse, not just with SARS coronavirus 2, but with any other public health threat. Months on end of weakening guidelines have entrenched this idea that mitigation can only be dialed in one direction, down, Salomon told me. If and when conditions worsen, the rules may not tighten to accommodate because the public has not been inured to the idea that they should. If it's going to be 600 deaths a day soon, or perhaps far more, Ganapathy told me, I won't be surprised if we find a way to rationalize that too. So I have to say kudos to Catherine Wu here. Um, her earlier articles, I found more to criticize in. I was pretty much right on track with this. I don't think you can cover COVID consistently and not see just how, like what a fuck up it is. Uh, that, I mean, the system is as far as um, actually being able to handle this. All right, so um, let us go now. I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Here's an article. 10 COVID facts that health officials dangerously downplay. Just continuing on this theme of um, things that need to be done and aren't being done. We should be rallied to defend ourselves and our kids. Our leaders offer timid silence. This is by Andrew Nik Nikiforuk. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, and it's from last week at the TAI, Independent Journalism website. Let's read. As the pandemic evolves, the failure of current public health policies now shines clearer than a midnight star. The assumption that hybrid immunity, vaccines combined with infections, would end COVID's relentless evolution has fed the pandemic, not starved it. If getting infected, vaxxed or vaxxed plus infected, actually made us as safe as COVID circulates, oh, actually made us safe as COVID circulates, Canada wouldn't be recording its highest death rate of nearly 20,000 this year. Yes, COVID has vanquished more Canadians this year than in 2020 or 2021. And the virus has sent more Canadians to the hospital this year than in previous ones too. If hybrid immunity was the solution, our children's hospitals wouldn't be in crisis with young patients on ventilators battling co-infections of the flu, respiratory syncytial virus, and COVID. There is much alarm about the fact that children are getting walloped, but little consensus on why. One misleading explanation, and we covered this yesterday, it's COVID immunity dead. COVID directly attacks and kills T cells. It's the only virus other than HIV that just straight up murders your T cells, and it directly infects them and it creates more copies of itself in the process. And so you get people walking around with dramatically reduced T cell counts for months and months afterwards, immune dysfunction for eight to 12 months after a COVID infection. And then that leaves you more susceptible to bacteria, fungal infections, viral infections, and so on. So anyway, we covered that in part one yesterday. There is much alarm on the fact that children are getting wallop, little consensus as to why. One misleading explanation is that because kids were shielded from other infections due to COVID protocols, they've incurred an immunity debt that has now come due. For the record, there is no such thing as immunity debt. Actually, I have another um, quick little um, visual here. There was a good tweet I want to give uh, the person credit for on this one, immunity debt. So this is at long COVID hell. Let me get this straight. Many claim that masks don't work and they do. And we're gonna look at the evidence for that later in the stream. But the, um, so on the one hand, people are claiming masks don't work. Then the same people on the other hand are gonna claim that the loose fitting cloth masks that many wore under their noses and chins nearly two years ago 
also worked so well at the same time that they were not working that we now have a so-called immunity debt. Which one is it? You can't, can't have it both ways. Uh, yes, astute observation there. Immunity debt is bullshit. It's immunity impairment. COVID hurts your immune system. It attacks your T-cells. All right, anyway, let's get back to the um, where we were in this article. There we go. Uh, for the record, there is no such thing as immunity debt. And until we have a better understanding of what's going on, we can't rule out another thesis that repeated exposures to COVID may have weakened children's immunity to other infections. A recent, not yet peer-reviewed preprint study found, for example, that children who had been infected by COVID had a much higher incidence of RSV, that's respiratory syncytial virus, than children not infected by the virus. Research also shows that respiratory infections can lead to surges in invasive bacterial infections. In any case, there's no mystery to what we should be doing to protect ourselves and our kids. Don't listen to powers that be who pretend that getting infected with COVID multiple times is now no big deal. They're asking you to lower your guard for a nasty virus that can invade the brain. COVID directly in infects your brain. It's been found in the brains of people who have died from it, dysregulate the immune system and damage the vascular system. The strategy has led to predictable results, more direct deaths, more excess deaths, more disease, and some 1.4 million Canadians reporting some form of long COVID over the last two years. So in Canada, they have made uh, medically assisted death. And um, there are people applying for to be euthanized, like people in their early 50s, um, you know, have many more natural years left ahead of them, but they've been disabled by COVID and they're, they can't afford their apartment or like wherever they're living, they're gonna end up homeless and they're applying to die because of poverty resulting from long COVID. That's, we've covered that. So um, that's the situation, you know, with this continuing. Don Bodish, professor of medicine and Canada research chair in aging and immunity, recently spelled out the consequences to the Toronto Star in terms the politicians dare not speak. Quote, Canadians collectively are going to be less healthy and live shorter lives than we did in the pre-COVID world. She bases her view on hard facts. Given that 4.5% of people infected with Omicron go on to develop long COVID, and by the way, I would say that that number is way low. Um, better estimates are 15 to 20 percent, as we've covered many times. I don't know where they're getting 4.5 percent, but a chronic and debilitating condition that can last years. We can expect declining health in the population as the new normal. Unless, of course, we reject the fantasy that we can end a pandemic by pretending it's over without changing a single behavior or condition of living. Brendan Crabb, an infectious disease expert, immunologist, and director of Australia's prestigious Burnett Institute, bluntly tells the truth, quote, it is never okay to get infected with a pathogen as part of a strategy to not get infected by that pathogen. Yeah, so to put this another way, no uh, infectious disease has ever been controlled by allowing uncontrolled spread. So what should we be doing instead? The solutions are not hard or onerous. They do not involve lockdowns or even major rule changes. Well, I would not rule out uh, lockdowns in certain targeted situations, but let's see. The key is to simply and systematically reduce viral transmission with clear messages that get the job done to protect the general health of our citizens, children, and elders. Everywhere, all the time. Providing schools and workplaces with good ventilation and filtration is doable and even cheap, given that Canada has spent $9 billion on COVID hospitalization costs alone this year. So they're saying put that money into ventilation and filtration and you're preventing, you know, and it's a better situation. Why isn't that happening? Well, I can tell you why. <laughs> Um, so a lot of the places that, not schools so much, all the private schools, yes, um, and workplaces, this is private property. Those buildings are private property. And, you know, where are you going to get all the contractors to do it? You would need a massive, um, I mean, you would need a nationalized economy to do that. You would need socialism to do that. Now, we are for socialism at this channel, but you're not going to see that out of capitalism. Um, that would take a massive 
nationally coordinated effort, a planned effort, and when the economy is just in the hands of lots of different little capitalists, that's not, and to them it's just an expense, adding that ventilation and filtration, it's just an expense. So you would need to federally fund it. I mean, that's doable, but actually getting compliance, you think that the shutdown protests were bad. I mean, the anti-ventilation and filtration protests, you know, then they go out, they start running their campaign, the petty bourgeoisie, um, starts running their campaign to convince people that, you know, it's just communism or whatever. And um, yeah, so you could do it, but this person is dramatically underestimating the resistance from capitalists to uh, incur costs and alter their private property. Putting on an N95 mask or a respirator in public spaces radically reduces transmission and protects everyone. Why isn't the government providing N95 masks for free to encourage their widespread use? Now, absolutely, but you can't just encourage it. You actually have to mandate it. So this idea that we don't need rule changes, honestly, that's naive and idealistic. Um, you actually have to mandate that because they were giving out N95s in some places and people weren't taking them. You have to actually have an N95 mask mandate where people are not going to use them. We don't have a culture where masking is normal. And so in order to promote that, you actually have to require it for a while. And then people get used to it and like it just becomes a part of life. All right. Why did um, isolating when sick and old fashioned courtesy reduces the spread of disease? Why did we abandon this basic communal kindness? Well, it costs money to stay home and not go to work and things like that. So you actually have to pay people to stay home. So again, this article, while it's making a lot of the right points, is somewhat naive in its understanding of money. And uh, now, again, this channel is a Marxist channel. We're all for uh, making these reforms and then having a revolutionary overhaul of the system to uh, make whatever we get permanent and then some. Because the bottom line is if you leave power in capitalists' hands, I mean, that's basically the answer to why, why isn't this happening is capitalism is the answer to every single one of these questions. So until you change that, you, we're going to end up with a situation like this. So yeah, it's not just courtesy to like, oh, I'm going to take two weeks off of work. Well, no, people can't do that. You need an overhaul of the work rules and pay people to stay home. That's why people were able to do it in 2020. Providing access to testing gives everyone information about viral movement and prevalence. It also invites proper treatment or respectful isolation. Why have we retreated from medical accountability? Well, uh, rapid tests, you know, can be sold for profit. Doesn't cost the government money or not as much. I don't know if they're subsidized in uh, some places or not. But um, yeah, the PCR test, that was, you know, giving out free PCR tests, it was costing money. They don't want to do that. Also, logging all the cases, you get a higher case count and it's harder to, you know, have your bullshit line that the pandemic is over. But if you have people just doing rapid tests and testing positive and then throwing it in the trash and it never gets logged anywhere, then it doesn't look like a societal problem anymore. So, yeah. Public health officials have a duty to advance health and serve the common good. I agree. They abandon that responsibility when they kowtow to the short-term needs of cowardly politicians with an eye only on election cycles and disease of power. Yeah, but again, this is, uh, you need to factor capitalism in there because who does the politicians work for? Politicians work for capitalists and they usually are capitalists also themselves. Uh, lower level capitalists, but that that's why that's capitalism is the answer to basically every single one of these questions Public health is a joke in the United States. We don't have really a functioning public health system um, That's just a fact. So yeah, so it's not just the politicians. It's the people who own the country Why then aren't we being consistently reminded by health officials that the pandemic poses real risks to our health and the quality of lives. In particular, why aren't officials daily reminding people of these critical 10 points? Now, the next 10 points are pretty good. But again, the, the naivete here is um, because they would rather shoot you dead in the street than make major changes to the system. That There's your basic response. All right. Um, one, COVID is airborne and travels like smoke. Many public health officials still refuse to acknowledge this glaring fact. Until government makes a major investment in ventilation and air filtration in public schools, we risk kids getting COVID more than once a year. 
I'd say three or four times probably. As I noted earlier, we don't know what impact repeated infections will have on children's immune systems and vulnerability to other kinds of infections, but it could be damaging. In fact, you know, after the evidence we were reviewing yesterday, I'd say it's, it is likely damaging. In fact, the stakes could be enormous. As a writer for The Gauntlet put it, the idea that a child born today could contract COVID 40 times before college and still live a normal, healthy lifespan is completely unsupported by what we know about this disease. A responsible society cares for its young. A failing one does not. Couldn't agree more. Two, COVID is a disease of the vascular system. It inflames the lining of blood vessels in both the young and old and can cause blood clotting. This explains why COVID infection can leave in its wake a variety of cardiovascular injuries, including stroke, restricted blood flow, inflamed hearts, and blood clots in the heart and lungs, which can kill you. It also explains why COVID in different people affects different organs. The infection travels by the vascular system to the brain, the gut, the heart, the lymph glands, and the kidneys. It was never, as hubris has alleged, a cold or just the flu. Three, COVID alters and ages brain function for up to two years after an infection. Based on the health records of more than a million people, a Lancet study, it's a major medical journal, found that COVID infection increases the risk of a psychotic disorder, cognitive deficit, dementia, and epilepsy or seizures up to two years after the infection. And we've talked with people here in the uh, S4A chat who I didn't even realize the seizure connection until somebody was mentioning it. I looked it up and yes, that's a long COVID symptom. Even a mild case of COVID can shrink the brain, dramatically affecting neurological functioning and have the impact of a decade of aging. Now, I like that they mentioned that. That's actually um, one of my go-to uh, this is just an impactful image. I often share this. This is from National Geographic, uh, the UK edition. Even mild COVID-19 can cause your brain to shrink. Recent brain imaging shows that the disease can cause physical changes equivalent to a decade of aging and trigger problems with attention and memory. So they're still, this was in April, they're still working out the why of it, but the what is very clear. So I share that a lot and that's even mild COVID. Oh. Well, it was just like a cold. Okay, great. Your brain may not feel the same way. Um, so let's uh, continue there. But yeah, that's one of my go-to articles. Anyway, uh, four, having COVID is associated with a 66% higher risk of developing new onset diabetes. We found this especially in children uh, had increased risk of both type one and type two diabetes. So says an article in Scientific Reports. Another paper found that the risk of diabetes increased 1.17-fold after COVID-19 infection compared to patients with general upper respiratory tract infections. So you get a, you know, a regular cold virus or something, um, you know, your risk of developing diabetes after that is a certain amount. Your risk of developing diabetes after you have COVID specifically is much greater. Five, and, and that's thought to have been from the previous things we read, just because COVID attacks the pancreas and destroys the parts of the pancreas responsible for insulin. Uh, five, COVID damages the heart and can cause sudden strokes in young people. Prior to the pandemic, excess deaths from strokes were on the decline in the United States. Using data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or as we call them, the U.S. Centers for Disease, Researchers found that excess deaths from strokes rose 23 to 34% among young people between the ages of 25 and 44, and rose 13 to 18% in older age groups since the beginning of the pandemic. Six, each and every COVID infection exerts a toll on your health. Reinfections increase the risk of developing diabetes, kidney disease, organ failure, and mental health problems, according to research published in Nature Medicine. The authors found that people with COVID reinfections were twice as likely to die and three times more likely to be hospitalized than those with no history of previous COVID infection. Moreover, people with repeat infections were three and a half times more likely to develop lung problems, three times more likely to suffer heart conditions, and 1.6 times more likely to experience brain conditions than patients who had only been infected with the virus once. 
as one recent Canadian study noted, because each new SARS coronavirus 2 infection carries some risk of long COVID, everyone remains at risk for developing the condition. Now, I just want to um, highlight there, I just have a couple of uh, things on the reinfection. So we covered this story back over the summer. This is by William Hazeltine at Forbes. He's a really good, uh, he wrote a book on long COVID and he's really good with his articles. So this article was called More Danger Ahead with BA5. COVID-19 re, uh, reinfection doubles the risk for death, blood clots, and lung damage. So this article shows, this is from July 13, uh, that basically every time you get reinfected, your odds of all these things just go up and up and up. So we had another here. This is uh, from Tildo Baggins on uh, Twitter, at Real T Baggins. We don't even know the extent of the long-term effects of COVID infection and won't for nearly a decade. But what we know now looks bad, at least in this massive cohort. Cumulative infections increase the likelihood of hospitalization and exacerbate the most post-acute sequelae. So post-acute is after that you know, more severe first few weeks phase. Sequelae are basically consequences, you know, like the word, like a movie sequel, something that comes after. So um, there you can see across the right side and the sources down at the bottom, acute and post-acute sequelae associated with SARS coronavirus 2 reinfection by Al Ali et al. 2022. So number of infections per individual. Now you can see zero, all of the, you know, the baseline risk is considered one. Then at your first infection, all of them go up. At the second infection or your first reinfection, they go up sharply, much more than they went up the first time between zero and one. And then specifically hospitalization is much more likely on your second infection or your, again, first reinfection. Uh, but all the other things in the chart, kidney problems, cardiovascular problems, blood clots, pulmonary or lung problems, fatigue, gastrointestinal problems, diabetes, mental health, other neurological problems, and musculoskeletal problems. Every single one of these goes up. By the time you get to your second reinfection or your third overall infection, these are dramatically higher. Um, more than five times the ratio of uh, the kidney problems. Hospitalization is up almost eightfold. So you know, these are things we really, really need to keep in mind with the reinfections and just letting things rip. So back to our article here. Number seven, immune dysfunctions, and we highlighted this for like an hour in yesterday's stream, can persist for up to eight months and possibly longer after a COVID infection. Australian researchers found an ongoing sustained inflammatory response following even mild to moderate acute COVID-19. So, okay, you have mild, you know, borderline asymptomatic COVID, but you're still getting a sustained inflammatory response because it can be a few things. Uh, persistent low-level infection, as is common with many viruses, after you actually beat the virus, some of it lingers in your system. Turns out COVID, the spike protein itself, can not just, um, I mean, it serves as the key that turns in the lock of your ACE2 receptors, on most of your body's cells to get in and infect the cell. It actually infects different receptors on your T cells. We were covering that yesterday as well. But that spike protein, it can not only be used to gain access to your cells, it can be used to directly trigger inflammatory processes in your immune system. So just if you have that low level infection and you have that spike protein in your body, it can be triggering your immune system to engage in pro-inflammatory behavior, which in the right context can be a good part of your immune system, but in not in that context, it causes aging and tissue damage and is not good for you. Eight, women are at greater, greatest risk for long COVID. We don't know why, but we don't improve things by ignoring the evidence. And yes, there is a, um, I'd say medium-sized greater risk for women to get long COVID. And basically every study of long COVID, um, it's been more women than men uh, reporting the symptoms. So and it seems like it's more than just a difference in reporting. It seems like it actually does affect women more, but nobody knows why from what I've read uh, at this point. Nine, vaccines alone won't deliver us. 
When public officials now speak to us, they invariably hammer home one simple message, get vaccinated. No argument here, yes, do get vaccinated. Still, we should keep some important caveats in mind. Although vaccines have significantly reduced deaths and hospitalizations, their effectiveness is waning as the virus that causes COVID, SARS coronavirus 2, evolves. And by not engaging in other public health measures, we make it easier to spread and therefore to evolve. And I say this all the time, how does COVID evolve? Well, every time that the virus replicates or is replicated by the host cells that it tricks into making copies of it, there can be errors in the copying of the genetic material in it. And those are mutations. Sometimes the mutations are disadvantageous to the virus. And so the resulting copy is not as well adapted. It's not as fit for the environment and it does not reproduce as successfully as the one that came before it. Sometimes it's neutral. It's just a horizontal move that doesn't really change anything. And sometimes those mutations confer advantage. And really it's just a matter of time as you're letting it spread and spread and replicate and replicate that you're rolling the dice. You're going to get those advantageous mutations eventually. And we've gotten plenty of them. We're seeing new strains come in every two or three months by now that have significant advantages over the previous ones. So uh, by not engaging in other public health measures other than vaccines, we make it easier to spread and therefore evolve. And consider this flaw built into the current messaging strategy. Just why would the public seek out booster shots, which really do work for a short period of time, when the authorities pretend that the worst is over and that no other interventions are necessary. So that's a great point. We've made that before. People are confused. Why do I need a booster shot? I already got two shots or I already got three shots. Why do I need another one? Um, especially when they're saying that COVID's not a big deal anymore. It's total mixed messages that have resulted in very few people getting booster shots uh, this fall and winter. Well, we're just like a week into the winter, but this fall and, you know, this whole like September through December uh, period when the new booster shots that are tailored to BA4 and BA5 have become available. So, yeah, there is no single technological fix that will dispatch COVID, let alone end the pandemic. So, yeah, it's helpful, but you need behavioral change. Ten, we are all in this together. There is only one way out of our COVID mess. It is not denial and it is not passivity. It's masking, testing, social distancing, and clean air engineering via ventilation and filtration. Public health officials and politicians aren't telling us this because they're afraid to take on the responsibility for implementing these changes, or they're too ashamed to admit the scale of their mistakes. Again, we'll step in for the naivete here, or they're being paid to run a pro-capitalist agenda of sending people back to work, no matter the cost, maybe even because of the cost, because people who get long COVID and die at 68 instead of 78, well, you know, they don't need their pensions and things like that. You get to work them and then you don't have to take care of them in their retirement. That means that each and every citizen must send them a signal that we refuse to surrender to an immune evasive virus. And we have not even seen the worst of COVID yet, most likely. All right, where it's at now, nothing says that this is the end point whatsoever. It's rapidly evolving new variants. And there could, like I said, be another quantum leap into something very unforeseen. And that the prospect of massive ill health of our children is not acceptable collateral damage. The pandemic will not end until we consciously and collectively act. We can only do that by systematically changing conditions of modern life to starve this wildfire of its fuel and oxygen. And that's very true. So we're going to take a minute here and I'm going to check in with the chat before we go into anything else. I feel at a certain point like I'm repeating myself. Uh, but this bears repeating because we need to remember why the hell we're, we're doing, uh, you know, uh, why, why we are still wearing the masks and et cetera, et cetera. All right. So where are we with the chat here? Scrolling up. Do we have a mod here? I'm not seeing the mod, but there aren't that many people in the chat anyway. All right. I think I found, found the place here. Japan has announced that they are probably lowering their disease classification of COVID from second highest priority to lowest priority. 
This is at the same time that they just had their highest single day of deaths. When I say point three, the U.S. and other, most other countries are moving in exactly the wrong direction, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You can no longer trust the public health departments on COVID because they're just lying to your fucking face. Um, I have someone on Discord that caught COVID five times. That is not good. The more you catch it, the more, more immune you are, slash sarcasm. Yeah, definitely not. Uh, somebody was asking what the source was on the percentage data back in the BioBot section. Literally just Google long COVID symptoms. It's in the image tab. Um, you can find the study from there. Well, if COVID's going to last millions of years, humanity will not. It's kind of that simple. Being in an airport sucks enough already. I can't imagine dealing with that cop. Yeah. Um, so somebody's talking about, we can see with other viruses that their mutations occur slowly. Um, COVID is like mutating more quickly. Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't really say that. COVID is spreading very rapidly. So you need to understand that. And SARS-1, I mean, we have a track record on this kind of coronavirus. Um, they spread, like when it came out, it had a pretty high rate of spread. Every infected person I think was infecting two and a half other people. It keeps mutating because tens of millions of people just keep getting it and spreading it over and over and over again. And um, yeah, so. Oh, interesting article, the virivore that eats viruses. All right. Has the CDC ever tried to control this virus or just do, you wrote HR, I think you mean PR. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, for a while, up until mask or vax, we were doing a lot better. And then Biden got in, it was the whole, we have vaccines, we're going fully back to normal approach. That was May, mid-May 2021. It was shocking. And I said then, you know, there's like no turning back from this, basically. And we are now... Um, you know, well into that time. And I unfortunately just lost the chat because I clicked on, um, I guess my system's at its sort of limit. I'll come back to the chat in a minute because um, I clicked on that link and it's slowing the browser down. So we'll see what happens there. Um, I will get back to the chat in a minute, but in the meantime, let's continue um, with the rest of this. Real quick, there is uh, something that we covered before, bears mentioning again life expectancy is dropping in the US. So here's a very you know clear example of the outcome here. US life expectancy dropped sharply, the second consecutive decline. This is from August 31st uh, of this year, so just a few months ago. And the pandemic is the primary cause. However, increases in the number of people dying from overdoses and accidents is also a significant factor. So the current uh, people born in the U.S. in 2021, now the life expectancy is 76.1 years. That's the lowest life expectancy since 1996. And it is much lower for certain demographics. American Indian and Alaskan Native people have experienced a greater drop uh, going from 71.8 to 65.2 years. So it's because um, they are more oppressed, living in worse conditions because of the way that the U.S. has, you know, set, set everything, has set up those conditions. And so when things are bad overall in America, that's where they're worse. So, yeah, um, just a reminder as far as what's actually happening. I think we actually, there's, a, there's like a, a visual on that in one of these slides. There you go. There you go. And so uh, women were expected to live um, longer generally before um, males had a lower life expectancy. Anyway, both have dropped. 
So that's um, pretty significant. And it's sharply on its way down. We have no real reason to expect that to turn around on its own uh, right now. All right, so let us go now a little bit for a whirlwind tour of the international situation. Uh, in the UK, this is out of the sun. I swear there's like an advertisement every other paragraph in this, but the information is there. Strain pain, new COVID variant running rife in UK will spark a surge in cases as, as the same time as the flu is exploding by Sam Blanchard. This is from December 1st. So they're talking about BQ1. That is, um, according to the Biobot numbers, which actually I can show you, so the variants in the US, you can see there in the upper right corner, that's the most recent thing, uh, where you can see the most recent data reflects samples from the week of November 28. Um, so this is like a, on a month lag for the variant data. Anyway, BQ1 in the US, as of a month ago, was at like 40% or so. Um, and on the way up, clearly. So in the UK, it was a little bit ahead and it had already surpassed uh, 50%. So it was the dominant strain. All right, a new COVID variant has taken over in the UK and could drive a surge in cases, putting more pressure on the NHS, health chiefs warn. The BQ1 Omicron offshoot is now dominant, makes up 50.4% of infections compared to 39% last week. It comes as NHS figures suggest a small rise in the number of people testing positive for COVID in hospital, with 4,964 cases reported as of November 30, up 8% on the previous week. And flu is rising significantly, with hospital patient numbers up 44% in a week to 586. Ambulance delays are already at record highs, with one in seven patients waiting longer than an hour to get into an A&E. Professor Stephen Powis, medical director at NHS England warned, we expect this to be the NHS's most challenging winter yet. Huh, gee, I thought things were better. I thought the pandemic was over, yet we're hearing the most challenging thing ever. Uh, as we move toward Christmas, we will see increasing levels of flu in the community and increasing number of patients needing admission to hospital. We're also seeing increases in the number of patients with COVID. There is a new variant circulating, BQ1, which is becoming the dominant variant. That's an offshoot of BA5. Uh, and it seems likely that's going to drive further increases. In some countries in Europe that have it, you can already see growth in hospital admissions. So this is a nasty strain of COVID again coming in in the US. No doubt that those pressures will increase. It comes almost a year to the day after the, no, see, they're still doing milder they're, after the milder Omicron strain was first discovered. Omicron is not milder. Uh, they're still printing that lie. So anyway, that was a full year ago. We've been in this for a year. Look at how much COVID has been happening since then. Earlier this year, patient levels topped 14,000 at the peak of the wave of infections caused by the Omicron BA4 and BA5 variants. This was well below the level seen during the height of the pandemic when few, fewer people had been vaccinated. Um, yes, but what is the trade-off? So yes, let's put the, uh, the thing back up. And this is for the US, not the UK, but there is a similar overall trend. Okay, Omicron was a gigantic spike and that was still in the first year when not as many people were vaccinated and things like that. But now more people have had multiple reinfections. What's that doing to people's health? And look again at the amount of uh, SARS coronavirus 2 in the wastewater since then. Is this a decent trade-off or are we just trading old problems for new? I would say the latter. Anyway, uh, moving on to the next screen here. Yeah, so Dr. Mary Ramsey, um, Director of Public Health, so they're, just keep publishing, I skipped a line, studies have found that the Omicron is less aggressive than earlier strains. This is a lie, this is a flat out lie. Dr. Mary Ramsey, Director of Public Health Programs at the UK HSA, urged people to get their booster jabs as she warned, we would expect to see the prevalence of COVID and other winter viruses begin to increase as people mix more indoors, that's what the data are beginning to show. And they keep repeating the mild infection thing because they're looking solely at the acute phase and uh, this is completely misleading. So anyway, that is um, a snapshot of what's happening in the UK. 
Meanwhile, let's look back at Canada again, where there is a lot going on, and a bit about the hospital situation. So there is um, a grassroots organization reporting that COVID-19 hospitalizations due to Omicron are vastly underreported. Might that be contributing to this misleading impression that it is somehow milder? This is from CTV News, uh, Dina Zaidi. With provinces releasing less frequent data on COVID-19 three years into the pandemic, in other words, they're, you know, maybe it used to be daily and then you can cut that back to weekly or, uh, you know, monthly or something like that. A group of volunteer experts has been releasing their own analysis of cases, highlighting a vast underreporting of hospitalizations and deaths in Canada due to the Omicron variant. Recent figures based on this analysis show that expected hospitalizations from Omicron could be 70% higher on average than what has been reported in the last year since December 2, 2021, if the rest of the country reported as Quebec did. If each province reported in a similar fashion as Quebec, which is the gold standard in Canada for complete and timely reporting of severe COVID outcomes, then these numbers would look very different from those that have been reported. Tara Moriarty, an infectious disease expert at the University of Toronto and the co-founder of COVID-19 Resources Canada, told ctvnews.ca on Tuesday. The difference is also significant for Omicron deaths, which are expected to be 51% higher than reported, according to the data. It became critical to provide this information to the public, said Moriarty. Founded in March 2020, the grassroots initiative, made up of scientists, healthcare professionals, and web developers, collates data from different sources, including information from provincial databases and Statistics Canada, and it gets its funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Expected Omicron cases across Canada are underreported. So this is actually from August. So since December 2, 2021, so that was about nine months at that point, the total expected hospitalizations from Omicron in Canada were roughly 162,000, a huge jump of 70% from the actually reported 95,000 hospitalization cases, according to the information provided on the dashboard. Moriarty said even with reporting delays, the difference in hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and deaths from Omicron alone is huge. So you can see there, total reported versus expected. So there's like this gigantic gap. Um, apparently Quebec is still reporting correctly and everywhere else is dramatically underreporting in Canada. The article goes on, but I wanna make sure that we keep um, covering stuff. So we go from Canada and um, actually, let's let's do the Africa one right now. So uh, along similar lines, African morgue data reveals a more significant COVID-19 death toll than official reporting indicates. This is again, uh, William A. Hazeltine, who I mentioned earlier, reporting there. Uh, so the low rate of reported COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations, and deaths in sub-Saharan Africa throughout the pandemic has raised many questions especially when Omicron infections swept the globe. Africa has reported over 12 million COVID-19 cases and over 255,000 deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. While these numbers are significant, they pale in comparison to reported cases and deaths among countries in North America, Europe, and Asia. It's likely that a lack of access to testing is distorting the reported data. New data from a study led by Boston University School of Public Health researchers suggests that the reported COVID-19 death toll in Africa is substantially higher than official records indicate. PCR testing confirmed active COVID-19 infection in nearly 90% of deceased individuals at a morgue in Lusaka, Zambia. By contrast, only 10% of these individuals tested positive for COVID-19 while alive. That's a big discrepancy. The researchers further confirmed COVID-19 as the cause of death through lung biopsies on a select subset. So they took a sample of those uh, corpses and they um, found, you know, they dissected the lung and, and that's what they found. Um, you, obviously, you can't do all of them, but that would indicate that there's, you know, at least a certain percentage is consistent. Uh, and you can probably generalize that to the group. 
The study was conducted during peak transmission periods during July 2020 and June 2021. The results of the study, built upon the author's previous post-mortem, after-death, surveillance of COVID-19 at the same morgue in Lusaka, published in February 2021. The study found that 15 to 19 percent of 70 deceased individuals tested positive for the virus between June and October 2020. The majority of deaths occurred outside of hospitals and in communities with very limited or even non-existent COVID-19 testing. The results of these studies suggest that there is gross underreporting of cases and deaths in Africa due to limited resources and lack of access to testing. This represents a serious unacknowledged threat, not only to the people of Africa and visitors to the country, but also for the generation and evolution of new viral variants. So you have a lot of spread going, you're more likely to get new variants generated. Accurate COVID-19 mortality reporting is essential to inform the choices of the public health officials and individuals. By understanding the mortality risk associated with COVID-19, the public can assess their own risk, we're getting on shaky ground here, and make use of life-saving tools like masks, vaccines, and antiviral drugs. Why are people so goddamn scared of a mask mandate? Is that such a scary thing? Um, unfortunately, as we enter our fourth year of a pandemic that shows no sign of slowing down, uh, underreporting of COVID data seems to be the new pandemic spreading across the world. China, once a leader in pandemic control, is now using a narrow definition for reporting COVID deaths, including only people whose death is caused by pneumonia and respiratory failure. So if COVID kills you another way, they're not counting it. At this stage of the pandemic, we now understand that issues like blood clots, heart problems, and sepsis, that's general um, just spread of pathogens throughout your body, like, you know, um, just toxicity throughout your body from like bacterial spread, for example, can be caused by COVID-19 infection and have resulted in countless deaths around the world. China has also reduced their requirements for mass testing, quarantine, and isolation. According to the GIS, AID database. China is also not providing up-to-date information about current variants. China has submitted uh, a total of just seven, uh, 667 Omicron sequences compared to nearly 2 million from the U.S. As long as access to testing remains an issue, surveillance of COVID-19 mortality needs to include cases where infection is presumed but not confirmed and use a broader definition of what constitutes a COVID death. Only then can we help protect our communities from the risk of death from COVID-19 infection. In the U.S., the CDC has been updating cases and deaths on a weekly basis instead of a daily basis since late October. This time lag makes it far more difficult to predict risk and surges. State health departments also face an uncertain future regarding the funding that they need to continue reporting. Other countries like Australia have also shifted to weekly reporting, despite experiencing a higher mortality than any other stage in the pandemic. So this is like the thing about Japan. It's like you can have your highest uh, single number of deaths in a day. Oh, time to relax restrictions. What? No. You know, I get that, you know, you don't like that it's been three whole years and we're entering year four now. But that doesn't like that's not going to make this thing wrap up any sooner. That's just the ostrich approach, you know, head in the sand. Reducing reporting capacity or underreporting globally at a time when COVID variants are evolving to become immune evasive is akin to walking into a storm without checking the forecast. Yeah, it's like, um, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and no one is there to hear it doesn't make a sound. It's like, well, you know, if a virus is ripping around the world and nobody tests for it, did it really happen? Well, yeah, of course, because uh, in this case, you know, it's doing the damage, it's killing the people. So um, they mentioned Australia there. Let's do two quick things about that and about the whole uh, thing of uh, with versus from COVID. Did you die from COVID or did you die with it? Well, as we can see from this, that distinction is basically meaningless because they follow the same pattern. Let's read. This is by Karen Cutter, who is with the COVID-19 Mortality Working Group of the Actuaries Institute. Say that 10 times fast. Um, for Australia. So they're talking about excess mortality, that's excess deaths. And uh, so, yeah, at Karen Cutter 4, uh, K-A-R-E-N-C-U-T-T-E-R 4 on Twitter. Strap in, folks, this is a long one. 
there's a graphic there, but I'd rather get to the um, explanation. So the blog about this had not been uh, quite published yet. This is from December 6th, but I have things to do. I needed to get this thread done. I'll link the blog at the end once it's published. As always, our excess deaths are measured relative to pre-pandemic expectations of mortality, including an allowance for changes in population size and age mix, continuation of pre-pandemic mortality trends. So in other words, people die all the time, right? Like people are born all the time, we live a certain amount of time, and then there is a certain amount of mortality on an ongoing daily basis that you can expect. Death is a part of life, and people are always dying every single day. It's predictable because there are observable trends over time in how people are dying. Okay, so then if you start getting a lot more deaths than you would expect in a given period, those are considered excess deaths. And of course, they're allowing for changes in the population size and age, like the uh, balance of ages. You know, obviously older people are more likely to die than younger and uh, continuation of pre-pandemic mortality trends. So also terminology, COVID-19 deaths may be from COVID-19, where COVID-19 is the underlying cause of death, or with COVID-19, where there was another underlying cause, but COVID-19 was a contributing cause. And then, quote, incidental COVID-19 deaths are not counted as COVID-19 deaths. We're going to unravel some of this. August saw another two weeks of very, very high deaths counts, followed by two weeks that were only very high. We estimate 10% excess for the month of August, lower than previous months. This is due to lower respiratory deaths than predicted, reflecting the earlier than normal flu season. So we saw that yesterday with uh, Canadian pediatric hospitalizations for flu, uh, just going off the chart at a time when in most normal years, the average would have just barely been getting going. You can see the charts there. Deaths from COVID fell across the month of August. Deaths with COVID follow the same pattern as deaths from COVID, suggesting that COVID is a catalyst rather than being merely coincidental. This potentially blurs some of the lines between uh, from versus with COVID deaths. So in other words, even the quote, you died with COVID, the COVID helped that death to happen. You might have survived whatever the other condition was otherwise. After removing from and with COVID deaths, significant excess remains, particularly around the time of peak COVID, January, and flu, June and July. This suggests delays in emergency care impacting and or possibly undiagnosed COVID. So after you remove the direct COVID deaths, you still have a lot of excess deaths. So she's suggesting that this is uh, from uh, emergency care being impacted, maybe by all the COVID cases and the possibly um, undiagnosed COVID. So it may have been COVID, but just wasn't listed as that. Breakdown by cause. Total deaths to end August 2022 estimated at 13%, or in other words, 15,400 higher than predicted. The next graphs show the excess for each underlying cause. So include them with the COVID deaths. All use the same y-axis to give a sense of relative contribution to that excess mortality. The 13-week average is shown in order to highlight any trends that may be there. So ischemic heart disease, clear increase, and the overall biggest contributor to the excess deaths. Can COVID-19 contribute to that? Absolutely. Cancer and cerebrovascular uh, causes increasing trends. Diabetes, higher than expected throughout the pandemic. Dementia, there was a negative excess in 2020 and 2021 correlated with lower respiratory illness, uh, followed by increase in 2022 correlated with COVID-19 and flu waves. Respiratory, <clears throat> significantly lower than expected, except for the short early flu season in June, July, 2022. <clears throat> of course, the um, relaxed guidance um, year. Other diseases lower than predicted in 2020, correlated with lower respiratory, but as a group, the largest contributor to excess in 2021 and 2022. So continuing on here, uh, we have a table showing excess each year, both for all deaths and again, excluding deaths from and with COVID. 
Note 2022 ends in July because that's all they had at the time of the report. There are excess deaths in all age groups in 2022, and this is generally significant statistically, even after removing the COVID-19 deaths. This graph shows excess by age band, each on the same scale. That's the lower graphic. From and with COVID deaths are shown separately in orange. Excess deaths in 2022 are dominated by the older age groups, but we generally also expect many more deaths in these age groups. Here's the same graph, but with the excess shown as a percentage of predicted deaths. The older ages still experience the most significant increase, but the younger age groups also had excess deaths in 2022 that are materially higher than expected. Female non-COVID-19 mortality experience in 2021 and 2022 is noticeably worse than male, especially in the 0 to 44 years age band. Note the small numbers mean that there is considerable natural variation. And finally, closing this one out. To summarize, deaths with COVID-19 followed the same pattern as deaths from COVID-19 in 2022. Two, non-COVID-19 excess deaths were highest when there were peaks in COVID-19 and influenza deaths. Three, non-COVID-19 excess deaths are less apparent when there is no COVID-19 circulating. Four, deaths due to some causes, like dementia and other diseases in particular, are closely correlated to the level of respiratory disease circulating. Five, non-COVID-19 excess deaths are particularly apparent in the oldest two age groups and the youngest two age groups for females only. Based on these observations, we have summarized the possible causes of the non-COVID excess mortality into this diagram, showing excess deaths from respiratory disease, other non-COVID causes, and those from COVID-19. So that chart, you see 2020, 2021, and 2022, and uh, labeled various things, delayed emergency care and undiagnosed COVID-19, causing a massive spike um, in 2022 early on, and then really all throughout the year, which, so real quick, <laughs> now look at that chart closely. All right, try to burn it into your memory there so you can visualize that. And again, this is Australia versus the US, but tell me if you see any similarities. Yep, so we have several early peaks, but overall it's lower than a big one for Omicron. And then throughout 2022, just a sustained plateauing surge. And let's look again, it's the same shape. So these are the consequences of just letting it rip. One more thing, and then we will go back to the chat. The browser has uh, decided to behave itself now. It's worked out its problems. So what did I say? This is cardiorespiratory. All right. This is from censored Gregory Travis, at Greg underscore Travis on Twitter. Two young male sports reporters have now suddenly dropped dead within a week of each other. Sounds like the beginning of a mystery novel, but there's no real mystery here. Since February 2020, nearly 40,000 young men have died because of the 20% increase in average monthly deaths from cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. That would be 40,000, a four, and four zeros. So there it is, deaths per month in males aged 25 to 54 from cardiovascular or respiratory disease. On the left side of the chart, you see January 2018, up to the beginning of the pandemic, January, February 2020, and then the average for February 2020 to July 2022 is 40,000 higher. It goes from the high 7,000s to, uh, well, a lot more. So very clear chart there. Let's continue with that. Same chart as above, except excluding deaths where COVID was also listed. These are young men who died of cardiovascular or respiratory disease and did not also have COVID listed as a contributor to their death on the death certificate. 32,000 extra deaths. So when we talk about this, uh, you know, there was like a whole right wing conspiracy theory going for a while that like, oh, they're you know, they're marking COVID-19 on all the death things just to make it seem like a problem. First of all, the people who run the system, the last thing that they want is a problem. You're stupid for believing that. Like, you just don't understand the interest of the people who run the system. Their interest is in cover-up and keeping things running business as usual, not having people 
actually take measures to protect themselves because their gain is our loss, our loss is their gain, our gain is their loss, their loss is our gain. So they don't want us just taking care of ourselves. That means lost uh, profits for them. So yeah, you, you, you just have it backwards. So actually what we're seeing here is indicating the opposite, um, that the whole from versus with that, as the Australian data showed, is at best a blurry line, if there's a line really there at all. And what this is showing is that you've got the same pattern, um, even when you take COVID out, that there's extra young men dying of cardiovascular and respiratory disease, but they're not having COVID listed as a contributor to their death. So it's happening anyway. We're getting the excess death, and we're getting excess death from causes that are clearly linked to COVID from everything we understand about the effects on the body that COVID produces, cardiovascular disruption, respiratory disruption. And it's happening in an age group, men 25 to 54, where you don't normally have that kind of thing. Usually that's gonna kick in later, in your later 50s, 60s, 70s, all right? So this is unusual. And we can see it's excess deaths. It's above and beyond what you would expect. And again, it's that same pattern of, um, you know, it's following the waves of virus in the wastewater. It's following the waves of circulating virus. So it would strongly suggest a causal effect based on what we know. Continuing the thread, my friends, I feel like I'm, if I'm going to beg for retweets, this is the thread to beg for retweets. The implications is that we have been systematically undercounting COVID deaths in the 25 to 54 age group by a factor of two. Here is the same chart as the original, except I have added COVID cases in males 20 to 49 years old so that you can see the correlation between reported COVID cases and deaths from cardiovascular respiratory diseases. It's not the vaccinations, it's the COVID. Another implication of this, in parallel with the implication that we've been systematically undercounting COVID deaths, is that incidental COVID is a myth. I'll say that again, incidental COVID is a myth. You get COVID, it fucks up your health. It makes you more likely to die. It's that simple. Uh, and then they realized they had actually done a math error. They say, this is embarrassing. A Mastodon user pointed out that my averages could not be correct, particularly for the pre-pandemic period. Indeed, I screwed up the range in the spreadsheet where I was computing averages. The bad news is that actual data are worse now. So that disparity is actually bigger than was thought because the, um, the pandemic line, that's at the same level. But the pre-pandemic, it's actually uh, lower. So there's a 39% increase in deaths per month from cardiovascular respiratory diseases since the beginning of the pandemic on average versus the pre-pandemic. So on average, you got about a 40% increase in young men, 25 to 54, uh, you know, 20 to 49. Um, so that's a really significant thing right there. All right, and in how many other cases, you know, that's cardiovascular and respiratory stuff. How many other cases are you gonna see this in? All right, let's take a pause there. I'm gonna get into the China stuff next, um, but I wanna go back and catch up more with the chat because there's a lot of chat going on. Let's get the uh, screen back up here. All right. But I think a clear pattern here that COVID is being swept under the rug, underreported, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how they're actually handling it in practice. I've worked my whole life to eliminate social distancing, then bam, China. Yeah, it's not good news. Imagine thinking that the government is looking out for your best interest. Yeah, the, the government in capitalism is a committee of the capitalists to set the rules for running capitalism. It is of and for capitalists. I'm not vaccinated, by, but I agree with you. Uh, I mean, you, you should go get vaccinated, especially now. If, if you get COVID, it's going to hit you really hard.
It's bizarre how many times I was told to essentially not worry about the virus multiple times throughout these two years. Yeah, I hate it. I, I hate having to do this. Um, I'd rather that we, you know, would be pressing on victorious uh, with various things. I would rather not be covering this over and over again. It's honestly a little bit scary to me that a random Marxist channel with about 12,000 subs is one of the only channels. I mean, there are others. Uh, I'll give a shout out to Gez Mettinger, uh, Run DMC. They do um, a lot of stuff on long COVID over there. That's one of the few channels that I really see consistently doing good stuff. There's other people. There's Don Ford on Twitter. There's various like COVID people on Twitter um, that I see promoting stuff. But it's like it's becoming like voices in the wilderness. There was more info put on downplaying the crisis than strengthening any concerns since March 2020. Yeah, for like a couple of months, there was a half ass shutdown and then that was it. So, um, somebody says, also, fuck Neil deGrasse Tyson, unrelated. Somebody says, yes, he's weirdly very closed-minded. Somebody uh, replies, it's more common among academia than you think. Since the denunciation of Marx, they basically accepted metaphysical materialist analysis, um, disregarding any natural science, considering it Marxian. They're anti-scientist scientists, anti-science scientists. And sometimes they get work done, but since lack of public funding in 90s, it's completely a grift. Now we have this popular scientist who sells books and gets media spins who want to be the authority of their field, rather than advocating for objective truth through, through the dialectical method. Yeah, there's a couple of like typing issues in there. I cleaned it up a bit. But yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Um, you know, the people like Jordan Peterson, these sort of gurus who have a somewhat technical sort of background, and then are just sort of building like, you know, a popular cult around themselves um, rather than science. Well, because the why is this happening? There's a bottleneck in terms of um, implementing science. So we've talked about this a lot about how capitalism and the focus exclusively on like short term, you know, this quarter's profits um, that comes first always. That's always the priority. And so you know, any time that the science would indicate something to the contrary, the science gets muzzled. And so in capitalism, the profit motive comes first, which is also the profit mandate. They have to do it or some other capitalist is going to buy them out, you know, take them over, be more competitive and, and take them over and then they'll lose their um, enterprise. And uh, so, yeah, science is really throttled in capitalism. And you know, if, it, if it's not in line with the profit motive, it just gets ignored. So I think we've hit this point where what science can actually do in the world, generally speaking, is completely capped. There's this gigantic bottleneck. And so, you know, people interested in science and changing society to be better based on, you know, actual under scientific understanding of reality. Um, it's just not there. I mean, you can't implement it because the system is completely locked into um, trying to preserve itself through increasing fascism um, to protect profits above all else. Like progress is not a concern anymore. So if you believe in science and you're not a socialist, I don't know what you're thinking, but um, capitalism is forever for the rest of your life going to um, be completely constraining the ability of science to make any appreciable impact on society as a whole, resulting in a lot of academia just being fluff. Yeah. Well, because it it stays abstract when it can't be applied. You know. Capitalism is a plague. We must nip in the bud. Yes. Communists will use capitalism to make the money and use socialism to run the place. No, I, I don't. That's not really consistent with an understanding of what <laughs> building socialism is about. Um, 
yeah, the main thing about communism is to abolish capitalism, definitely. I was going to turn into a social butterfly when the masks came off, but people are still shitty, so let's go back on lockdown. So I'll tell you, um, during Delta, you know, I got my vaccine, I was masking. I was comfortable at that point with the level of risk where I started, um, I was ready to like do more stuff out there in the world. I was looking at um, an academic program and various things. And then Omicron came along and they decided, I mean, they being the entirety of the power structure in the US and even beyond the US, to just be like, oh, well, let's ignore it. And I was like, uh, I'm no longer comfortable with how this risk is being managed. So, you know, that was, uh, that's, that's where I was at was like, you know, with Delta, I was comfortable to go back out and I even did some traveling and, uh, you know, was like, wow, it's been a year and a half and I'm able to actually set foot back out in the world again. And it was starting to feel good. And then again, along came Omicron, a new material reality, the virus had evolved and uh, not a new social response. If, in fact, if anything, the new social response was less, not more. And, you know, a qualitatively worse response. So suddenly the natural risk went way up and the, the societal mitigation went way down. So, man, this has been a bad year and 2023 does not look better. Just, you're taking enormous risks even to just do normal life things. And it's, it's unacceptable. Vascular damage is just not cool. Yeah, you kind of need your blood vessels, you know? Showed that link to my mother-in-law because she works at a hospital. She said it's definitely a noticeable thing with the brain shrinkage. Yeah, so in that article, they noticed like an overall, I think like 10% decrease in brain mass, but it's also in specific regions like um, off the top of my head, I think the hippocampus like in particular shrinks. So yeah, COVID does fucked up things to your brain. I've never had COVID, but have mental health problems. Curious. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you had, you know, well, it says, I don't know if I can deal with any more mental health problems. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I was talking about before about health risk is the way that it goes is you know, this factor will up your risk by 5%. This factor will reduce your risk by 7%. This factor will up your risk by 15%. And this factor will up your risk by 10%. You add it all up and you have an overall predisposition or, you know, uh, or negative predisposition resistance to a particular, uh, to developing a certain disease or, you know, set of symptoms. And you got, you got to kind of do everything that you can to push your risk profile in the correct direction. And, you know, if you already have some of the things that COVID can cause, even in people who don't have them, COVID's likely to exacerbate them. So if you have existing lung problems, you definitely don't want to get COVID because you're already into the orange zone, if not the red zone, as far as your lung health goes. And, you know, same thing if you have mental health issues. COVID is not going to make them any better. Let's put it that way. Best case is COVID doesn't make them any worse. But you're not starting at zero. You're starting at, you know, a, a negative number because you already have existing mental health problems. COVID could definitely push them into like a crisis zone. Not good. Tangential to COVID, but I've noticed a lot of healthcare professionals quitting in large part due to burnout. Private capital is turning healthcare into a capitalist hellscape for healthcare workers, and it's causing healthcare workers to quit. Thank you, Heap. Um, actually, I have an article on that. So let's go into that right now because that can't ask for a better segue, actually. What did I save it as? Saved it as nursing home. Boy, do I have a lot of articles here. All right, there we go. This is a short one. No one wants to work in American nursing homes after COVID. And it's not just nursing homes, it's healthcare staff in general, nurses in general. This is from Quartz. 
the long-term care industry is 400,000 workers short, and nursing homes are the most affected by the staff shortage. This is by Annalisa Morelli, August 23rd this year. In February 2020, just before COVID hit, there were about 1.6 million people employed in nursing homes in the U.S. By July of 2022, fewer than 1.4 million were, according to data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. A sudden reduction of employment in healthcare affected all health sectors, from physicians' offices to dentists to outpatient care services, as COVID hit. But while most of these sectors recovered relatively swiftly, getting back to pre-pandemic levels, long-term care employment is still struggling to meet the needs of patients. So you can see there healthcare jobs that are back to pre-pandemic levels and uh, there you go, but um, continuing. Nursing care facilities, residential mental health facilities, and community care facilities for the elderly have lost a combined 400,000 workers since the beginning of the pandemic. And even though the trend has reversed toward the end of 2021, the pace of recovery is too slow. Nursing home workers have been quitting for years. So the situation is especially dire for nursing homes, which are already struggling with personnel shortages before the pandemic and have lost 15% of the workforce since February 2020. So you can see there a second chart, healthcare jobs that haven't returned to pre-pandemic levels. Nursing care facilities, obviously uh, the bottom blue line. Also community care facilities for the elderly and residential mental health facilities. So again, you have like daycare, uh, day treatment, for the elderly and then residential. So more of the residential and those kinds of settings rather than more of like a short-term inpatient, like a hospital or you know a clinician's office where it's just an appointment. The decline in nursing home employment was accelerated by COVID, but it does predate the pandemic, like you were saying. Nursing home staffers had been complaining of burnout and unfair working conditions and pay for years before the pandemic, but COVID turned a trickle into a waterfall. Because remember, some of the worst COVID outbreaks were in nursing homes. So you're being asked to like, basically run into a blazing inferno and you're already disgruntled. It's a recipe for quitting. Between 2015 and early 2020, the nursing home workforce shrunk by about 50,000, but by 2022, it had lost 200,000 more workers. This is already having severe consequences. According to data from the American Healthcare Association, or HCA, nearly 90% of nursing home providers report being understaffed, and about 50% are severely understaffed. Further, 98% report having trouble hiring new personnel, and 99% have had to ask their existing employees to work extra shifts, which is in turn likely to drive away those remaining personnel. The AHCA also found that more than 60% of U.S. nursing homes are cutting down the number of patients they can assist because they aren't able to find the personnel, and 71% of them struggle to find qualified, interested caregivers despite offering wage increases and bonuses, although I'd like to see how much they actually offered. Research from the University of California, San Francisco, suggests that the situation will become even more dramatic in the coming years, with a projected shortage of 2.5 million long-term care workers by 2030. So this is the thing, and at some point you have to realize that if uh, just increasing pay and bonuses isn't doing it, you need a new goddamn system. Because there comes a certain point where, not for any amount of money, are, are people willing to work in there. But if you had a different system where the worker's experience was actually different, maybe then, you know, maybe then. All right, back to the chat. Yeah, COVID is just a flu like polio is just a cramp. Yeah. Or HIV is just a cold or something. Yeah, until you get the long-term symptoms kicking in. Because initially, as we've said before, HIV produces flu-like symptoms up front. And then there goes your immune system. <laughs> COVID is human nature.
well, there you go. 32,000 young men dying as a result of COVID. Wouldn't that explain partly as to why women experience higher levels of long COVID if the men are just dying, whereas the women are surviving? Yeah, I don't know. You, you, I mean, you could study that. You would need a lot more data. Um, we wouldn't be able to answer that offhand. Yeah, you would need to like control for those numbers and see if there's still a statistical, statistically significant difference. We don't have those data. All right, we are caught up with the chat. So let us continue, the three dozen of us in here, as we blaze a trail into some of, continue the international discussion with some of what's going on in China. So, uh, let's see, what did I name my China articles? All right, well, we did the one. Oh, there's one thing I wanna mention, actually, as a segue into the China thing. China got blamed, you know, they're calling it the Kung Flu and all that other shit. Uh, blaming China for, um, you know, originating COVID. That's not necessarily the case. Some people say it's a U.S. bioweapon. I just think we need to stop it right now. I don't really care if it's a bioweapon or not. We can find that out after people stop dying and getting injured from it. Uh, a lot of the pieces, a lot of the same people who tell you it's a bioweapon with extreme certainty also think it's not serious and you don't even need to wear a mask or get a vaccine against it. So again, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But again, I think it, origin is less important than how do we end it right now. But as far as, um, you know, China has taken a lot of shit during the pandemic because um, they took it really seriously and they had a very visible response to COVID. So because they had the first visible societal response to COVID and they were building hospitals and all kinds of stuff, I mean, inspiring stuff, actually, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, they got the blame for it. But there were many indications that actually um, there may have been cases in southern Europe, Spain and Italy in November 2019. So before the first cases were reported in like December in Wuhan. And I mean, it's still known as like the Wuhan strain. So anyway, here's an article off of WebMD. Now, I'm not sure what the deal is with this because I actually had to go to the, um, the Wayback Machine for this. And uh, it's you like I used the link and it redirected to the front page. Obviously, it's been archived. So I went there. Um, COVID-19 appeared in Boy in Italy in November 2019 by Ralph Ellis. December 14, 2020. Retroactive testing shows COVID-19 appeared in Italy about three months earlier than first believed. A finding that may explain how the pandemic swept across the nation with such devastating speed. So you may recall after China, Italy was like one of the first major outbreaks. Well, yeah, it could be because it was there for several months, actually. A four-year-old boy in Milan had a cough on November 21st, 2019, and was taken to the emergency room with acute respiratory problems on November 30th, according to a new study published in the CDC's Emerging Infectious Diseases. On December 1st, he developed a measles-like rash, and on December 5th, an oropharyngeal swab specimen was taken. That's um, through the mouth. Uh, that's a basically upper throat swab done in the mouth. Was taken for clinical diagnosis of suspected measles. But doctors in Italy's measles and rubella network later noticed that some patients who were thought to have measles ended up testing negative for measles. Researchers re-examined 39 swabs of suspected measles patients, including the boys. His swab tested positive for coronavirus, the study says. That apparently means that the boy had COVID-19 about three months earlier than the first confirmed COVID-19 cases in Italy, which were identified on February 21st, 2020 in Codogno in the Lombardy region, the study says. The existence of the virus in Northern Italy three months before anybody knew, quote, would help explain, at least in part, the devastating impact and rapid course of the first wave of COVID-19 in Lombardy, the researchers wrote. Italy was the first European nation ravaged by COVID. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Italy has reported almost 1.8 million confirmed cases and more than 62,000 coronavirus-related deaths. 
The death count is the sixth highest in the world. Quote, these findings, in agreement with other evidence of early COVID-19 spread in Europe, advance the beginning of the outbreak to late autumn 2019, the researchers wrote. However, earlier strains also might have been occasionally imported to Italy and other countries in Europe during this period, manifesting <clears throat> with sporadic cases or small self-limiting clusters. So keep in mind, you know, we've seen, like we started with, quote, the Wuhan strain, and we got alpha and beta, gamma, delta, Omicron now, and all the Omicron offshoots, which really should have their own letters, but they're too cowardly to um, give them new Greek letters because that would mean that the pandemic is still not in control. So they just keep renaming Omicron by the uh, BA this and BF that. Anyway, so we know all these mutations, but what if actually the Wuhan strain was not the original strain, but there were early Italian strains that were less severe, and then they mutated from there. Anyway, the study didn't say how the boy, who had not traveled outside the region, contracted the coronavirus. Scientific evidence so far shows that the coronavirus developed in Wuhan, China, and spread outward to other nations. So he had not been outside the region, so yeah. The researchers said that further studies of archived samples will be crucial in determining, quote, exactly the timeline of the COVID-19 epidemic in Italy and will be helpful for the preparedness against future epidemics. So anyway, I've seen a number of data points on, you know, uh, the earliest cases being in Southern Europe, exactly like that. Again, remember the thing about Africa where you can have the virus, but if you can't test for it, you know, tree falling in the woods. Um, in Europe, you have some of the best medical facilities around. And so the testing is there and the detection is there. Now in China, they have, um, you know, good uh, medical systems as well. But uh, yeah, anyway, China gets the blame. That's the point. And that may not really be fair. But anyway, uh, continuing on. So we s see now uh, the Chinese government going the same route as the U.S. Saw this screen earlier. Scientific assessment of COVID situation. These are just basically ways of saying it's mild and it's endemic, just slightly fancier language, but going the exact same wrong course as the United States. Let's get some specifics on that. And let's keep in mind that the reporting on China is whether you think they're socialist or not, or heading towards socialism, half do, half don't in the s audience, that's fine for now. Um, the reporting on China is from countries like the US and the UK is the height of hypocrisy. China can be doing something literally better than the US and the US you know, can be doing the exact same thing but worse. And uh, they'll be making it out like um, you know, China's uniquely awful it's just completely unfair. Um, now, I need the one that says China. There we go. So this is from AFP News Agency update. Chinese President Xi Jinping has urged officials to take steps to feasibly protect people's lives. In his first remarks on COVID since Beijing, dramatically loosened hardline containment measures this month. Quote from Xi, we should launch the patriotic health campaign in a more targeted way, fortify a community line of defense for epidemic prevention and control, and feasibly protect people's lives, safety, and health. Okay, so you're letting it rip, in other words. Update, China is now experiencing... How is this going? China is now experiencing the planet's biggest surge in COVID-19 infections after abruptly lifting restrictions that torpedoed the economy. So... Yeah. Studies have estimated that around 1 million people could die over the next few months. When you die, you don't come back. So that is permanent bad news. Now, um, looking at what they're doing with the quarantine situation, because they were really controlling. Uh, you'd have to like go stay in a hotel and, you know, test negative and all this kind of stuff when you came into the country. China to end quarantine on arrival in fresh COVID rule relaxation. Larry Chen, December 26, 2022. China said Monday that it would scrap mandatory quarantine on arrival, further unwinding years of strict virus controls as the country battles a surge in cases. Seems like bad timing. Having mostly cut itself off from the rest of the world during the pandemic, time out, that's 
really not a fair characterization at all. They're a global hub and uh, I believe hosted the Olympics as well. But they were trying to cut the virus off from their country. That's what they were actually doing. Bizarre. Again, when you read reporting on China, it's just, you know, um, extraordinarily negative no matter what. China is now experiencing an, uh, you did it, okay, that was repeated. And in a sudden end to nearly three years of strict border controls, Beijing said late Monday that it would scrap mandatory quarantines for overseas travelers. Since March 2020, all passengers arriving in China have had to undergo mandatory centralized quarantine. This decreased from three weeks to one week this summer and to five days last month. But under new rules that will take effect January 8, when COVID-19 will be downgraded to a Class B infectious disease from Class A. Why? The, the <laughs> Okay. They will no longer need to. Quote, according to the National Health Quarantine Law, infectious disease quarantine measures will no longer be taken against inbound travelers and goods, the National Health Commission said. So... I just see, you know, somebody sitting in front of a stack of papers, grabbing them and just tossing them over their shoulder. That's what's that's what's happening here. The move is likely to be greeted with joy from Chinese citizens and diaspora unable to return and see relatives for much of the pandemic. Now, that's not entirely true. Um, I mean, you could get in there. The flights in were expensive and. Um, you know, there there might be some complications with that, but you definitely could get in. So this is, again, uh, possible misinformation. But it comes as China faces a wave of cases that studies have estimated could kill around 1 million people over the next few months. Many are now, and that's what the U.S. has had for deaths overall. Many are now grappling with shortages of medicine while emergency medical facilities are strained by an influx of under-vaccinated elderly patients. Now, I would love to hear the um, justification for saying under-vaccinated. Overall, China has a much better um, vaccination rate than the United States has. So why are they saying under-vaccinated elderly patients? At present, COVID-19 prevention and control in China are facing a new situation and new tasks, President Xi Jinping said in a directive Monday. No, I mean, the, the new situation is you're throwing your hands up. The virus is not different. We should launch the patriotic health campaign in a more targeted way. That was that thing before. Impossible to track. Hospitals and crematoriums across the country have been overflowing with COVID patients and victims, while the NHC on Sunday announced it would stop publishing daily nationwide infection and death statistics. That decision followed concerns that the country's wave of infections is not being accurately reflected in official statistics. Beijing has admitted that the scale of the outbreak has become impossible to track following the end of mandatory mass testing. And last week, the government narrowed the criteria by which COVID-19 fatalities were counted. We were talking about this before. Um, uh, well, it's been ongoing. A move that experts said would suppress the number of deaths attributable to the virus. So this is going on across the world, as we can see. And now China's no longer even an exception. The winter surge comes ahead of two major public holidays next month, in which millions of people are expected to travel to their hometowns to reunite with relatives. Authorities are expecting the virus to hit under-resourced rural areas hard, and on Monday called for the guaranteed supply of drugs and medical treatment during New Year's Day and late January's week-long Lunar New Year holiday. In recent days, health officials in the wealthy coastal province Zhejiang uh, estimated that 1 million residents were being infected per day. I was expecting another word there. The coastal city of Qingdao also predicted roughly 500,000 new daily infections, and the southern manufacturing city of Dongguan eyed up to 300,000. Unofficial surveys and modeling based on search engine terms suggest that the wave may already have peaked in some major cities like Beijing and Chongqing. A poll of over 150,000 residents, uh, residents, sorry, getting tired, been streaming for a while, of the southwestern province of Sichuan, organized by disease control officials, showed that 63% had tested positive for COVID. Let's, let's uh, read that again. A poll of over 150,000 residents of the southwestern province of Sichuan, 
organized by disease control officials, showed that 63% had tested positive for COVID and estimated that infections peaked Friday. Keep in mind, though, these peaks, you can get reinfected after two weeks. So, I mean, peak, not for long. And um, we're probably going to do another day of update because I'm not going to hit all the articles in this uh, update. But one of the things I want to do is Biobot. They show the national. I show that a lot. They also show counties. It's not every county in the U.S., but many counties they have data for. And what you see is just repeated peaks, like a month and a half apart. And it just goes on and on and on. So you've had a peak. Great. Prepare for the next one because it's coming. Only six COVID deaths have been officially reported since Beijing unwound most of its restrictions earlier this month. But crematorium workers interviewed by AFP have reported an unusually high influx of bodies, while hospitals have said that they're tallying multiple fatalities per day as emergency wards fill up. The main funeral service center <clears throat> in the southern metropolis of Guangzhou postponed all c- ceremonies until January 10 to focus on cremations due to the large workload, according to a notice published online Sunday. China's sensors and mouthpieces have been working overtime to spin the decision to scrap strict travel curbs, quarantines, and snap lockdowns as a victory, even as cases soar. Now, that may be true, but that exact same statement also applies to the U.S., to Canada, to Australia, to the EU, going back for an entire year. So China's late to the game, yet somehow they're trying to single them out here when they've actually done more to protect people uh, over the course of this, including you and me not in China, because, yeah, it's true um, that this could spawn new variants. China is a very large population, and that can mean a lot of virus. That's a lot of dice rolls for are we getting new mutations out of these replications? Yeah, very likely. So this was good for everyone, and it's a loss for us all that they're not going to do this. Now, a few more articles on this. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, this is again Yahoo Finance. By the way, across the top of the screen, looking good there on the financial. S&P, Dow 30, NASDAQ, Russell 2000, crude oil, gold, all down pretty significantly. Anyway, out of Reuters, China's National Health Commission to stop publishing daily COVID figures. So, uh, you know, again, we had the switch like a year ago. They're doing it now. It wasn't good for us and it won't be good for them. Beijing, uh, December 25th, Reuters, China's National Health Commission, which for the past three years or so has published daily COVID-19 case figures for the country, said it will no longer release such data from Sunday. Relevant COVID information will be published by the Chinese Data for Disease Control and Prevention for Reference and Research, the NHC said in a statement, without specifying the reasons for the change or how frequently China CDC will update COVID information. So just a brief one there. Let us continue. This is about the variant that's going through China now. It's from the National Post Canadian. Health Canada monitoring massive COVID outbreak starting to rip through China. <clears throat> now, as we mentioned before, most of Canada outside Quebec is uh, also underreporting their own shit by like 70%. So they might want to also monitor their own. But hey, they're monitoring China. Let's hear what they have to say. They don't have the same degree of community level protection that other parts of the world have, either through vaccination, through recovery from infection, or from both, says infectious disease doctor. Now, they definitely don't have as much from infection, but again, their vaccination rates are better than the U.S., so not really sure where that's coming from. This is from Ryan uh, Tumilty, Ottawa. Health Canada says it's monitoring the growing wave of COVID-19 cases in China, which experts are warning could kill a million people in the next few months as the country allows the virus free reign, I'll add, just like basically every other country at this point. China has done a dramatic U-turn in recent weeks, ending its zero COVID policy that required regular COVID tests, mandatory quarantine and sweeping, restrictive lockdowns to control the virus, which made sense. Dr. Isaac Bogak, an infectious disease physician at Toronto's University Health Network, said ending the zero COVID policy, especially in a population with lower vaccine rates, why do they keep saying this? Do, do I just have this wrong? Because I literally, let me see, let me see. I don't know if I, um, 
had this, I pulled it for something else. I don't know if I still have it on this drive here, but we did this in a, in a thing recently that China had better vaccination rates than the U S had both for primary and for boosters. So anyway, um, what we're seeing, obviously, very sadly, is that, you know, the virus is starting to rip through populations. More than 5,000 people are probably dying each day from COVID-19 in China, health data firm Airfinity estimated, offering a dramatic contrast to official data from Beijing on the current country's current outbreak. OK, so they're just going to say that they're just like straight up lying and that actually 5,000 people per day are dying. Are they? I don't know. But you know, again, um, same thing going on in Canada where there's dramatic underreporting. I would like to know the basis for this. So they said that the UK based firm said it had used modeling based on regional Chinese data to produce figures that also put current daily infections in the country at above a million. Its estimates were in stark contrast to the official data, which is reporting 1800 cases and only seven official deaths over the past week, it said in a statement. China's National Health Commission reported Thursday no new COVID-19 deaths and about 3,000 new local symptomatic cases for December 21st. Airfinity said its mortality risk an analysis suggested between 1.3 to 2.1 million people could die in China's current COVID outbreak. Analysis by other modeling groups has also predicted as many as 2.1 million deaths. Um, so anyway, a lot of this is repeat of the information we had before. I mean, basically, Airfinity is saying, like, take our word for it. They're not really revealing here the, um, the specifics of how they did that analysis or, or anything like that. Now, what I was talking about before, one variant circulating in China is BF7, an Omicron variant that is also present in Canada. Madison said that the government is continuing to follow it but it has not yet become dominant in Canada. True. Uh, let's see. Scientists are looking for signs that BF7 would change disease, disease severity and spread or impact the effectiveness of diagnostic tests, vaccines, or treatments for COVID-19. The emerging outbreak in China is also putting pressure on drug supplies in the country, prompting China to order more supplies from around the world. Madison said that Health Canada will work with industry if any shortages emerge, monitoring the global supply chain, yada yada. Okay, a uh, tiny bit of new information, at least about what is being said about China there, whether or not it is actually accurate. But let's talk a little bit more about the BF7. We've covered this before. Again, it's an offshoot of BA5. Uh, here's some more information from Live Science. And this is an article, a new Omicron subvariant is spreading in China. Here's what we know so far. It's actually not actually so new. It's been around a little while by uh, Manal Mohammed 13 days ago. BF7 is a new version of the coronavirus SARS coronavirus 2 that's driving a surge of infection in China. Since the COVID variant Omicron emerged in late 2021, about a year ago, it has rapidly evolved into multiple subvariants. One subvariant, BF7, has recently been identified as the main variant spreading in Beijing and is contributing to a wider surge of COVID infections in China. But what is this new variant? Should we be worried? I mean, you should always be worried with COVID, but although reports from China about this variant's characteristics are concerning, it doesn't appear to be growing too much elsewhere in the world yet. Here's what we know. BF7, short for BA5.2.1.7, is a sublineage of the Omicron variant BA5. Reports from China indicate that BF7 has the strongest infection ability out of any of the Omicron subvariants in the country, being quicker to transmit than other variants, having a shorter incubation period, and greater capacity to infect people who have had a previous COVID infection or have been vaccinated or both. So this is why we say in N95 we trust, or P100 even, um, the vaccine is your backstop, your quote, natural immunity is your backstop that comes at great, great cost to your body. You weather a lot of damage during that infection. But this BF7, it has high potential for reinfecting you. So don't think because you had it that you can't get it again. You absolutely can. To put this into context, BF7 is believed to have an R0 or R0 
In other words, a basic reproduction number of 10 to 18.6. This means that an infected person will transmit the virus to an average of 10 to 18.6 other people. So measles has a 12, roughly. So we're now into breaking new ground on the infectiousness and, and transmission capability of this virus. I mean, out of all the viruses we know about. Research has shown that Omicron has an average R0 of 5.08. So when we started this out, it was like two to three, all right? Over all the mutations, we're now up to 10 to 18.6. So for every person that gets infected, that's how many other people they're gonna infect. Used to be two, maybe three. Now it's 10 to 18 or 19, okay. The high transmission rate of BF7, taken with the risk of hidden spread due to the many asymptomatic carriers, is understood to be causing significant difficulty in controlling the epidemic, or, I mean, the epidemic of that strain, but the pandemic in its manifestation in China. The symptoms of an infection with BF7 are similar to those associated with other Omicron subvariants, primarily upper respiratory symptoms, and we will add up front during the acute phase. After that, brain damage, liver damage, kidney damage, on and on, immune damage. Patients may have a fever, cough, sore throat, runny nose and fatigue, among other symptoms. A minority of people also get GI symptoms like vomiting and diarrhea. BF7 may well cause more serious illness in people with weaker immune systems. Again, it has uh, got higher, not just transmissibility, but higher immune escape. Your antibodies cannot handcuff it and neutralize it as easily as they could past strains. It's evolving to escape our immune systems, which if it keeps doing that, will have disastrous results. I mean, it's already having disastrous results. BF7's mutations. As Omicron has evolved, we've seen the emergence of new subvariants better able to escape immunity, for either the immunity from vaccination or prior infection. BF7 is no different. It carries a specific mutation, R346T, so, just a technical note when you're reading mutations, the 346 is the position in the genetic material, the R is the previous amino acid that it was, and the T is the one that it changed to. So at position 346, the amino acid coded for by R has changed to T. Okay. In the spike protein of SARS coronavirus 2, that's the protein found on the surface of the virus, the little spikes that allow it to attach to and infect our cells. This mutation, which we can also see in BF7's parent variant, BA5, has been linked with enhancing the capacity of the virus to escape neutralizing antibodies generated by vaccines or previous infection. That also includes the monoclonal antibodies, which are basically just regular antibodies, which are then cloned scientifically. And uh, here's the deal. If you can't uh, capture the virus with your naturally produced antibodies, cloning those antibodies isn't going to do it either because it's the same antibodies okay um, they've had to decommission some of the existing monoclonal antibodies they just don't work against the current strains a recent study examined the neutralization of bf7 in sera a component of blood that should contain antibodies from triple vaccinated healthcare workers as well as patients infected during the omicron ba1 that was january and ba5 that was the summer waves of the pandemic BF7 was resistant to neutralization, driven partly by the R346T mutation. BF7 around the world. BF7 has been detected in several other countries, including India, the US, UK, several European countries such as Belgium, Germany, France, and Denmark. Despite BF7's immune evasive characteristics and worrying signs about its growth in China, the variant seems to be remaining fairly steady elsewhere. For example, in the US, it was estimated to account for 5.7% of infections up to December 10, which is down from 6.6% the week prior. While the UK Health Security Agency identified BF7 as one of the most concerning variants in terms of both growth and neutralization data, in a technical briefing published in October, it accounted for over 7% of cases at that time. The most recent briefing says that BF7 has been de-escalated due to reduced incidence and low growth rates in the UK. What does that mean? It means it's getting outcompeted by still 
worse strain. So as we covered before, the dominant strain in the UK is BQ1. That means that BQ1 has a growth advantage over BF7. Doesn't mean BF7 isn't serious, just means BQ1 is even worse. We don't know exactly why the situation looks different in China. BF7's high R0 might be due in part to a low level of immunity in the Chinese population from previous infection and possibly vaccination too. But again, we need to stop with this idea that, oh, people just need to get infected five or six times and then they'll be fine. No, literally you will be worse off. You're more likely to get hospitalized in every subsequent infection. We saw this earlier. It's like, where is the end game here? They're just like, oh, they just haven't been infected enough. No, fuck you. We need to stop getting infected. We need to stop the spread. They're on the right track. Now they're on the wrong track, which we've been on this whole time since like May 2020. We should, of course, be cautious about the data from China as it's based on reports, not peer-reviewed evidence yet. Since the emergence of SARS coronavirus three years ago, SARS coronavirus two, excuse me, three years ago, the virus has continued to evolve, acquiring genetic mutations more rapidly than expected. Yeah, well, we can expect it now and they're still not doing anything differently. Okay. The emergence of BF7 and other new variants is concerning, but vaccination is still the best weapon we have to fight COVID. No, it isn't. Masking, what you need to do is... So the vaccines are not preventing infection. I don't know if you noticed that. They're not preventing infection. Masks do, though, and those are actually the best weapon. Again, in N95, we trust. Vaccines are your backup plan. Get them, but they are the backup plan. And the recent approval by the UK drugs regulator of bivalent boosters, which target Omicron alongside the original strain of SARS coronavirus 2, is very promising, end of article. Well, yeah, the thing about the uh, bivalent boosters, though, is many people have said that they're underpowered, they're underdosed, um, because they are 50-50. They do target the BA4 and BA5 Omicron descendants, but then the other half of the contents of the booster is original strain COVID. Why would you even put that in there at this point? So people are getting low doses from those bivalent boosters of BA4 and BA5. It's better than nothing, but it's not as good as it could be. So anyway, um, we are approaching the top of the hour again, and I'm probably going to wrap it up for today. Let me just check if there's anything else I want to throw in today. Actually, yes, there is one article I want to do, and then just looking at, we're definitely going to do a third day here, and I'm just seeing if that needs to be a fourth day, but I don't, I don't think it, it, I don't think it does need to be, uh, I don't think it does need to be a fourth day at all. So um, I think we can get the rest of this stuff done tomorrow in a third update, actually. Won't, won't that be just lovely. So uh, last article here and prepare for some fear mongering about, you know, how China's uh, going to make new killer variants that are going to kill us all. So CTV News Canada again, China's COVID-19 surge might spawn a new coronavirus mutant. I mean, you can change might to probably will. Um, that's a picture of a hospital worker in protective gear, Disson, which by the way, at least they're still doing that. Um, that's in uh, Baigo New Area Aerospace Hotel, uh, Hotel Hospital in Baigo in northern China's Hebei province on Thursday, December 22nd. Uh, yeah, you can change might spawn to probably will um, because it's nothing specific to China. This is um, just like the European surge has spawned new mutations and the U.S. surge has spawned new mutations and South African surge has spawned new mutations. That's just, or, you know, uh, it's thought that Delta may have come out of India when they were having a surge in 2021, like the winter 2020, 2021, 2021, uh, can I say that? 2021. Surges spawn new variants. That's just kind of how it works because when it replicates a lot, you're most likely to get, uh, you know, some mutations that may confer advantage. So could the COVID-19 surge in China unleash a new coronavirus mutant on the world? Scientists don't know, but worry that it might happen. It could be similar to Omicron variants circulating there now. It could be a combination of strains, 
for example. So uh, you can get um, recombinant strains like XBB, which is a very severe strain. It uh, powered a surge in, I believe it was Singapore. Uh, we covered that recently. Whereas basically if you get infected with two strains of COVID, there's a possibility for the genetic material of the two strains to combine in your body. And then you get one of the X strains, which denotes that it's recombinant, it's combined to other strains. So that is possible. Uh, people get infected with more than one variant at the same time. Um, or it could be in something entirely different. Quote, China has a population that's very large and there's limited immunity. And that seems to be the setting in which we may see an explosion of a new variant, said Dr. Stuart Campbell Ray, an infectious disease expert at Johns Hopkins University. Every new infection offers a chance for the coronavirus to mutate. That's exactly what I've been saying. And the virus is spreading rapidly in China. The country of 1.4 billion has largely abandoned its zero COVID policy. Though overall reported vaccination rates are high, booster levels are lower, especially among older people. Now we're getting a little bit closer here, although my understanding is the booster rates are still better than the U.S.'s. So domestic vaccines have proven less effective against serious infection than Western made messenger RNA versions. OK, are you going to release the um, patent controls on that or what? Many were given more than a year ago, meaning that immunity has waned. So, again, we're going to critique China thoroughly on their, you know, their immunity has waned because they only got their shot a year ago. Meanwhile, in the U.S., you know, uh, that's just barely even discussed. OK, the result, fertile ground for the virus to change, as is, by the way, happening in the U.S. literally as we speak. When we've seen big waves of infection, it's often followed by new variants being generated, Ray said. About three years ago, the original version of the coronavirus spread from China to the rest of the world, or maybe from Italy to the rest of the world, and was eventually replaced by the Delta variant, then Omicron and its descendants, which continue plaguing the world today. This, I tell you, that Chinese stuff keeps plaguing the world today. You see how these articles are written. Dr. Shan Lu Liu, who studies viruses at Ohio State University, said that many existing Omicron variants have been detected in China, including BF7, which is extremely adept at evading immunity and is believed to be driving the current surge. Experts said that a partially immune, popula a partially immune population like China's, and again, you know, they've been actually protected from this virus, so they haven't sustained all the damage that you have to sustain in getting the, quote, natural immunity. That's not a bad thing. Um, we should be driving this thing extinct, not, quote, trying to live with it. That's not going to work. Anyway, um, it puts particular pressure on the virus to change. Ray compared the virus to a boxer that learns to evade the skills that you have and adapt to get around those. One big unknown is whether a new variant will cause more severe disease. Experts say there's no inherent biological reason that the virus has to become milder over time. Indeed, it really hasn't. Much of the mildness we've experienced over the past six to 12 months in many parts of the world has been due to accumulated immunity. So we can actually call that apparent mildness, not actual mildness. Like the virus isn't less severe. You just have um, more resistance to it because it's already hit you several times. So much of the apparent mildness we've experienced over the past six to 12 months in many parts of the world has been due to accumulated immunity, either through vaccination or infection, not because the virus has changed in severity, Ray said. In China, most people have never been exposed to the coronavirus. That's a good thing. China's vaccines rely on an older technology producing fewer antibodies than messenger RNA vaccines. But again, the efficacy isn't that much lower. So anyway, we're gonna do a section on vaccines tomorrow. Given those realities, Dr. Gagandeep Kang, who studies viruses at the Christian Medical College in Vellore, India, said it remains to be seen if the virus will follow the same pattern of evolution in China as it has in the rest of the world after vaccines came out. Or, she asked, will the pattern of evolution be completely different? Um, if you're getting fatigued just considering this, you're not alone. Recently, the World Health Organization expressed concern about reports of severe disease in China. Around the cities of Baoding and Longfang outside Beijing, hospitals have run out of intensive care beds and staff 
as severe cases surge. China's plan to track the virus centers around three city hospitals in each province, where samples will be collected from walk-in patients who are very sick and all those who die every week. Xu Wenbo of the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention said at a briefing Tuesday. He said that 50 of the 130 Omicron versions detected in China had resulted in outbreaks. The country is creating a national genetic database to monitor in real time how different strains are evolving and the potential implications for public health, he said. At this point, however, there's limited information about genetic viral sequencing coming out of China, said Jeremy Luban, a virologist at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. We don't know all of what's going on, Luban said, but clearly the pandemic is not over. Well, amen to that. And on that note, um, yeah, we enter year four. The pandemic is not over at all. I said last year that, you know, far from being over on New Year's Eve, the pandemic may just be beginning. And I think that that's what we're seeing in 2022. Uh, Maybe, you know, less of the catastrophic sort of morgue flooding where they need to bring in extra, you know, freezers and things. Um, But we're seeing unprecedented levels of virus on a sustained basis and they're more contagious and they're more severe. It just doesn't look that way because people's immune systems are going into hyperdrive trying to fight these things and sustaining a huge amount of damage, which is shortening lifespans in the process. So this is where we're at. We will continue our coverage as soon as we can. I I hope to keep it going this week and finish it out by the end of the year. If we have to do next week, we'll do that. But I'm going to try to do it this week. Anyway, let's check in with the chat and just see uh, what other comments we have before we close out this stream for the day and this installment of the COVID-19 year-end roundup. All right, there we go. I love Andrew Huberman, one of the premier neuroscience communicators of the modern era. He's be, really become popular during the pandemic. Has he done any COVID education? No, just a grifter, same as Tyson and Nye and the rest of them bastards. Yeah, it'd be great to see like people taking stands with integrity on things that like aren't popular. And you can't just measure it versus like, oh, well, look, he talks about climate change and the Republicans don't. You know, measuring the um, measuring anything really against the Republican Party is like about as low of a bar as you can get. Um, we need to tell the truth, and the Democratic Party falls far, far, far short of that. Which most of these people, they just will never step outside of that. It's total just, you know, they want to be in that um, rich people club, so... Asian hate crimes have gone up since the start of COVID, also here in the States. Yes, um, I mean, they were up under Trump, I mean, in gen- as a general part of the rise of the far right. But yeah, blaming China for COVID didn't help either. Yeah, my grandpa says the same shit. COVID isn't serious, but also it's a bioweapon from China, so we need to take out the CPC. There you go. I was fooled by the capitalists. You need to search for everything these days. Can't trust anyone. Yeah. So one of the first things I want to do in 2023 is sort of a mini course on evaluating evidence and critical thinking. You know, logical fallacies, quality of evidence, um, supporting your well-reasoned points with decent evidence, uh, things like that. Because, yeah, you got to go way out of your way to actually, um, you know, be able to think clearly on these issues so yeah oh yeah so um the vape scares at least many of them have been proven to be from black market thc vapes that had dangerous cuts uh vitamin e acetate um but uh yeah that was like right around the time that Oh, sorry, I'm getting like weird echo in my uh, my headphones now. I'm getting like a slightly longer lag on the monitor. But if you told me COVID was in USA and urban cities in July 2019, and those vape scares were actually COVID, I'd believe you. Those vape scares, yeah. So some of them may have been from black market vapes that were not really made up to snuff. But yeah, was there COVID earlier? Maybe, we don't know. And probably we'll never know now, but...
So a technical point on that, it was not proven, it was proposed that the vaping thing could be related, um, but they didn't show how vitamin E acetate would cause lung damage, whether it's unique to patients or common among the population, or that the cartridges were found to be cut with harmful additives. Yeah, that that's kind of, I remember when that was happening, um, but I don't... Uh, I don't remember. I like I I never really followed any of this specifically. Yeah, so we 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 don't really know. What we do know is that there were some apparent swabs, well, there were some swabs taken in November 2019, you know, before the pandemic was alleged to have begun in southern Europe, and those tests showed positives. Uh the swabs were tested and showed positives. Uh, for COVID and you know were they contaminated I mean it's possible but we did get positives off of that so Western journalists have absolutely no self-awareness yep Are they seriously trying to inflate the numbers to higher than those of the U.S.? That is outlandishly, laughably propaganda. Yeah. I have heard from comrades in China that the Western media claims that they stopped counting cases. That the Western media claims that China stopped counting cases is bullshit. It is hard to get accurate information out of China, so it would be easier if both things were not so insular. I mean, obviously the Western governments are going to do what they can. It's, I think, hard to get reliable information out of China. So we're often left guessing. Or you have to know somebody there, you know. little off topic but any chance for a stream on extinction on animals and uh you said planets i think you mean plants on earth i recently learned the vaquita and the saola are on the brink of extinction with a population down below 10 for vaquita and tens for saola and they can't be held in a captive because they die easily in captivity they're being killed by poachers uh yes actually i have some articles relating to i know insects um, so yeah, that's probable. I mean, I covered it a little bit recently where 70% of, there was like a 70% reduction in animals. We covered that a while ago, the World War, World Wildlife Federation. That's, I don't know, maybe 20 streams back. Uh, should I get another booster does it matter now that i have covid I, you know i don't know if you, if you have a provider ask them but i mean the ideal thing would have been to have gotten the booster prior to this winter um yeah i mean what i the last thing that i heard was get a booster 30 days after an infection because like that's as long as your immunity lasts even. So they're like, just get it every 30 days. I mean, this approach just isn't working and that should be like super clear by now. And people are sustaining like tons of inflammatory damage from just repeated infections. And uh, this whole like, I mean, it started with mask or vax. We'll see where we're at two years on in mid-May, 2023. But I think that this has been just a horrific chapter. I was much more confident earlier in the pandemic about this whole thing. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, delusion. I think that your thought about the animals is a bit... Um, it, we care about people as well. This does not need to be like an either or scenario. Um, when ecological systems collapse, that's going to have effects on us as well. And we have no right as a species to drive other species extinct. You can blame it on poverty. The fact is, um, 
it's not just being driven by poverty. It's, I mean, being driven by development, actually, and encroaching on habitat and climate change and all kinds of things. So, yeah, it's not an either or kind of situation like human well-being, animals well-being. In fact, to the extent that it is an either or, it's uh, humans, uh, I mean, you know, particularly capitalism driven development um, encroaching on on habitats. But, yeah, we'll cover that in a separate stream. Okay, we're going to wrap it up there for today. Thank you to everyone who dropped in on the stream. We will be continuing this in at least one other segment, and we will just keep going until we're caught up. Uh, end of the year is approaching, and I plan to take a little bit of time off in January. Uh, I've been going pretty hard at the channel and uh, want to get the COVID stuff out first. So thanks to everybody in the chat. You help make this stream what it is with your contributions and questions. And thanks to everybody showing up on YouTube after, and we will see you in the next video.